Ten years ago, Pokemon Black and White were released in Japan on September 18th, 2010. So, to commemorate this, I have invited Finchinator, a black and white expert, to reminisce on the past decade of the Gen 5 OU metagame with me. Say hi, Finch. Hey guys, what's good? Alright, so, a couple things. We're going to have replays playing in the background. They were taken from various tournament games throughout the years. We're not going to be covering them, but it's just something to look at if you like that. Of course, this is really more of a podcast with a slight visual component. But the visual component is there, and it is compelling because there are some really great tournament games in here. And as for the music, I went to YouTube and looked up Pokemon Gen 5 remixes by Acoustic Harmonia. I found it really quickly. You should be able to, too. So, without further ado, let's get into it. So, it's September 18th, 2010, and the new generation is released. So, you were not around back then. No, I was not. I actually came around in the middle of 2011, and I was like, oh, Pokemon Online, competitive Pokemon, this is all new to me. Team Preview, that must be the norm, right? Well, that was not exactly the case for Black and White, actually. No, and when a Gen 4 player like myself saw Team Preview, then everyone freaked out. I cannot overstate how much people were freaking out about it, because this went against absolutely everything we knew about Pokemon up until that point. Some people were citing it as a good thing, you're no longer going to be surprised by a last minute threat, whereas other players argued that being able to dance around those threats and figure them out is skill, and I think now with the benefit of hindsight they were both right. You know, It is nice to have some leeway against the stronger and stronger threats, but at the same time uh, th being able to figure out unknown Pokemon is a different kind of skill. And that's why we have the first four generations. So from here on out, I think this was a good time to introduce Team Preview because of power creep, which, you know, Gen 4 was already considered to have some pretty strong power creep, and Gen 5 makes it look like UU to the point where Gen 5 UU actually does look like Gen 4 OU. So, uh, yeah, it was nuts. I, I can't uh, overstate how much people were freaking out. People didn't want Team Preview implemented in the simulators, and I'm, obviously we went with it, but at, and people got over it pretty quickly, but at first people were losing their minds. Yeah, and I mean, it's funny because naturally we're resistant to change. We see a change that's fundamental to the way we play the game, and it's like, oh crap, this isn't good, but then you think of it, we got a whole slew of new Pokemon, like Axorus and Volcarona, and a dragon, we'll get into them more later. And then you have also the concept of weather teams. You have rain-boosted Hydro Pump, sun-boosted Fire Blaster, even things like gems that were introduced this generation, etc. that actually made it so that Team Preview is kind of, I don't even want to call it necessarily evil, because I don't view it as evil, but a necessity to counter, to combat the power creepers. Otherwise, who knows how teams defensively would handle things. No, I really can't imagine this generation without Team Preview. What's funny is that the mechanic was introduced because of Zoroark, because Zoroark, if Team Preview didn't exist, would be a nightmare. But with Team Preview, it's you know barely decent in UU. So uh, yeah, yeah that, that was interesting. really um, never gained traction this generation, which is funny because everyone day one is like, oh my god, you have this ability illusion. So not like we have Team Preview, but we have ways to like kind of manipulate Team Preview. This is surely going to be one of the best strategies, or something like Ditto, which can be imposter. And people were like, oh, this is going to be the best Pokemon. And, as I'm sure you alluded to, Ditto was a very, like, massive threat in the initial days, or people so thought it would be, at least. But it turned out that these Pokemon, they didn't actually get traction, but rather, Team Preview was used more as a way to plan the game, both offensively and defensively, figure out what you needed for what, what was your win condition, etc. And it's a tool that some of the best black and white players are able to use to their advantage drastically, not only in picking a lead, but also in playing through the game and really deciding what risks are worth taking, as opposed to what ones are not worth taking. You know what's kind of funny? I remember this log from the early days where people were talking about how much Zoroark sucks. And then five minutes later, this one guy who had just been ragging on Zoroark, he was like, Hey guys, does Vaporeon get Nasty Plot now? Also, it outsped my Heatran. And then he was like, oh. So it, it really took a while. I mean, people really didn't like Team Preview because the go-to example everyone seemed to use, no matter how skilled or not you were, was now people will never sack their Gliscor and Lucario will never sweep because that was a prime Gen 4 example. 
And while that logic obviously doesn't hold up 10 years later, then at the time it seemed completely reasonable because that's just how foreign Team Preview was. So, speaking of foreign and power creep, then some of the new Pokemon brought around were <sighs> monstrous to say the least. Uh, not oh, yeah. only because we dropped a lot of stuff into OU, but also because there were some new Pokemon added. Uh, so for, in Gen 4, we were just coming off the bands of Latias and Salamence, and people were me going, man, dragons are strong. And then Gen 5 releases this monster called Ononokusu, who we now know as Haxorus, which has 147 base attack and Swords Dance and Dragon Dance. And just because it wasn't good enough, it also has Taunt for Skarmory. So, people were losing their minds, pr predicting everything and a half to be banned. So, it, it was nuts. And it wasn't just, uh, well, it was a lot of offensive power creep because of the Dream World promising to drop, ha wreak havoc on us at a moment's notice. Things like yeah. Speed Boost Blaziken and Shadow Tag Chandelure and uh, Genesect waiting in the wings. And yep. Yeah, people were arguing against Shadow Tag Chandelure being broken, which is kind of a microcosm of the generation as a whole, because there were always immensely broken things in OU, and there were people who just went, nah, it's fine. It's not broken. So Yeah, it, and that's it, honestly how Black White kind of shaped around that idea, especially the modern generation of Black White. I mean, they found ways to, I don't want to say necessarily like completely evade, but really not necessarily tackle issues heads on. So the metagame became a bit of broken checks broken, and in a way, that's why we love the tier as much as we do, but in another way, it caused a lot of issues that BKC and I have to play cleanup for over the last five or six years. So that's always an interesting dynamic to see. But I think that back in the initial days, um, I mean, I think one of the best examples is that last generation, in Generation 4 that is, Latias got banned. It's obviously allowed in Generation 4 now, but it got banned back during that generation, whereas this generation... Not only is Latios allowed, but it's kind of just okay. Latios is allowed, and it's really good. I mean, the difference in power between those two, it's, it's night and day at times. But also, you see even stronger dragons. Again, like Haxorus, as BKC mentioned, Hydreigon was released, and counters these Pokemon steel types like Ferrothorn, which massive defensive presence with spikes. It goes a long way. And just the not only the power of creep, but also the progress-making creep, be it through spikes or permanent sand being as prominent as to combat rain, or, you know, moves like Scald, providing burn chances. And it makes so the games are oftentimes really emphasized. Every single turn matters more and more and more. And not necessarily in the same ways as before when you're trying to find out things from Team Preview or information, but rather in actually making physical progress in the game. And I think that goes a long way towards defining what Black White is. Yeah, every turn feels very, very charged with dangerous possibilities, if that makes sense, <laughs> because... You know, people sometimes rag on Gen 4 for being really fast-paced. I don't find that to be the case, but black and white, every single turn is just... Something is threatening to either get down spikes that are going to ruin you, or throw out a Leech Seed with Ferrothorn in the old days, because nowadays it's not used anymore, because Ferrothorn mm -hmm. is crazy, and we'll get to that. Or something's dropping a Spex Draco Meteor, or Banded Close Combat, or Outrage, or someone's boosting up with one of the million scary boosting things we have, and... It is, uh, it's arresting if you really think about it, because it really requires you to get a feel for the tier, because it's not like the other team preview generations. Gen 6, 7, 8, they all can go on for pretty long, which is a good thing. But yeah. Gen 5, you don't see a lot of really long games. You'll see one on occasion, but for the yeah. most part, it is a slugfest through and through. Yeah, games, I mean, on average can go anywhere from 25 to 55, 60 turns, and that's a fine range. Don't get me wrong, there are some longer, more drawn-out games, and there are some very fast-paced games as well, but you're seeing games in Oras or SS go over 100 turns consistently, and there's nothing wrong with that. I love a long game where every single PP matters, and... You, you know, know you what, it feels really like those games aren't even... Part. It feels like those games aren't even long, like the 90-turn ones. They just feel natural. Yeah, no fine with those games, yeah. but you just don't encounter them as frequently in black and white due to the nature of the generation. Yeah, black and white, the natural is like somewhere in the 20s. You know, once you hit 30, yeah. then if you hit 30, it feels like you're going to hit a lot more than 30. But most hey, of the time... I feel, like, um, I feel like now that we see more protect, we might see more games in the 30s and even low maybe. 40s, but yeah. still, it, it's averaging a lot less. And that's, yeah. that's, that's a lot. Because everything is so dangerous and 
crippling. Like if you're playing a Tentacruel offensive rain team, then Scald, you constantly got to be dancing around that. And you constantly got to be responding by threatening something even stronger. Uh, you mentioned broken checking broken, and I think that's, uh, you know, at this point, we could make black and white to be the most balanced generation it could be, but that's not realistic. So we, we have to enjoy and make do with what we have, which is this dance where Latios is busted and Keldeo is busted and a bunch of other smaller stuff, but it I'm makes the tier what it is, and it's still a good tier. Like, you're going to win if you play well and have a good team. So that's all you can really ask for. So And I think that, um, if you don't mind me interjecting with one more thing, I think ahead. that what's cool about modern black-white is that there were some things that maybe weren't necessarily broken, but weren't competitive, such as Arena Trap, Shadow Tag, um, God, Sandvale, forget about that crap. And they've all been, during the generation or through the black and white council's kind of retroactive behaviors, have been removed. So now, at least there's less... I don't want to call it cheese, but there's less, you know, there's no nonsense in the tier. There's a lot of room to outplay the opponent or at least out strategize the opponent. And if you're able to do that, then, I mean, people like Solwyn, for example, put up an amazing SPL run, and that's no coincidence. He's probably the best black white player of all time. So I, I think it goes without saying that the metagame has seen all sorts of experimental phases, be it the early days or nowadays, but we've gone through a lot and it's been an amazing ride. And White has, um, has given rise to a lot of great players, and I, I don't know. We'll get there uh, because we got to go oh, back yeah. to the beginning. So it's we the beginning. We will giving you guys a fully fledged history lesson. <laughs> so it's the beginning, and people are freaking out about uh, the Dream World pokes, your Speed Boost Blazikins, your Shadow Tag Chandelors, your Genesects, and uh, we didn't have to deal with a lot of them. Thank God, Shadow Tag Chandelor was never <laughs> released. Genesect was just delayed, but then there were also the new Pokemon, so beyond just your Haxorus, then Sand suddenly has actual abusers in the form of Sandrush, Excadrill, and Sandforce, Landorus, Incarnate. Uh, back then, it wasn't Landorus, Incarnate, it was just Landorus, because in Black and White 1, there were no Therians. Also known as Randorosu, by the way. Randorosu, yeah, because uh, we had the Japanese names at the beginning of the generation. Because uh, these were the last Pokemon games to have released in Japan before they were released everywhere else. So, for the first six months, Ferrothorn was Natore, Jellicent was Burunjeru, Hydreigon was Sazandora, Haxorus was Onanakusu, Conkeldur was Rabushin, Rapushin, something like that. Yep. I don't know how you would actually pronounce it, but... And uh, Volcarona, yeah. Volcarona was called a lot of things. It was Urugamosu, and then it was Olgamoth. But was somehow, Olgamoth, yeah, maybe, some, yeah, somehow everyone knew what you were talking about. It was the stupid thing uh -huh. with Quiver Dance. Well, Quiver Dance, or back then it was Butterfly Dance. Yeah. So yeah, it was power creep everywhere. Pokemon and moves because Quiver Dance and like Shell Smash. Uh, these absolutely astonishing moves and scald or back then boil over or boiling water yeah. that so and then of course uh, there was also defensive power creep now, it speaks to how strong the generation was when something as insane as regenerator gets introduced and it's barely noteworthy it's just like oh yeah whatever that's a thing and now in newer gens people go oh my god i hate regenerator but this is another way in which Gen 5 is unlike the later team preview gens because Regenerator is not even anything to write home about. It's good, but you're not going to see people out regenerating each other. So, no, definitely not. I mean, especially considering, let's just list some residual damages. We got Stealth Rock, we got Spikes, which very easily have multiple layers up. We have Sand, we have Burn, which is not only 12%, but also it's spread like wildfire and black white. Poison potentially. It list goes on and on and on. So sometimes if you're facing a Ferrothorn, you're taking 25% upon entry and then sand damage. And all of a sudden, like, why is it worth running Regenerator? And uh, spoiler alert, it can be sometimes, but more often than not, it's not. Whereas in Generation 8 right now, if you see a team preview and there's no Regenerator Pokemon either side, it's a blessing. It's a shock. So it just goes without saying that not having Defog, not having things like Magic Guard, which deter usage of those things, as much, every single D Magic Guard user in Black White is Pursuit Week. We got Alex, Xamarin, Nicholas, and Clefable is not really viable, but that's neither here nor there. Um, it, it just shows that the metagame, it, it caters towards this more rapid pace, this agenda of getting shit done, having no nonsense. And yeah, I even Reuniclus is vulnerable to getting overpowered, 
because yeah. of the weather. And we'll get to the weather in a sec, but I just wanted to keep going on the defensive power creep, which you know was there because Stahl was really strong for a lot of black and white, much to everyone's surprise. Uh, so you had Ferrothorn, which is just as... Ferrothorn is the most important thing Gen 5 introduced besides weather. And yeah. it, it's just an astonishing Pokemon. Spikes, Leech Seed... Actual attacking uh, stats and stabs. Yeah, like ninety some odd attack. Inc crazy. Incredible typing, absolutely astonishing, and oh, my god, it was just uh, it shaped every aspect of the meta game. So, uh, fun fact: in Black and White One, it could not run Stealth Rock, Spikes, and Leech Seed on the same set. It had to run two of the three, but uh, that was fixed in Black and White Two, or uh, change in Black and White Two, I should say. So. Yeah, Ferrothorn was nuts. I was a big Jellicent fan day one because I liked my defensive team, so I was looking at what uh, Gen 5 brought, and I always thought Jellicent was a big deal. Fun fact, I'm going to claim this. I was the first person to t put Taunt on Jellicent, and I will fight anyone on this because I did it day one, no. and no one else was even looking at Jellicent, so it's officially mine. And Jellicent was one of my flagship Pokemon throughout the generation, so I was very proud of that. Uh as it was someone who didn't play the first like week or two or month or two of Black White, would you say that Jellicent's early usage might have been because of Speed Boost Blaziken being as good as it was? Possibly. I mean, Speed Boost Blaziken was kind of overshadowed by all the new Gen 5 pokes at first, and then as the initial you know wave of stuff died down, then it became more and more prominent, and it went from being just another threat to, oh my god, this thing is ridiculous. And plus, Jelson exactly. wasn't even a guaranteed Blaziken counter because one of the most popular sets was Swords Dance with Shadow Claw, which also oh, wow. threatened Slowbro. So, yes. that was nuts. Oh, and finally, uh, it was important to mention Jellison as a defensive ghost because the Rotom forms, who were ghost types in Gen 4, now no longer were. So, most of the forms suck, but Rotom Wash became this incredible Pokemon uh, with being Electric Wash with uh, Levitate, meaning it only has one weakness. And it has Hydro Pump, uh, Stab on Hydro Pump. And there's this new little move called Volt Switch, because U-Turn just wasn't enough. And so it, this, it just becomes a monster day one, fighting rain, because weather is a big deal. Weather is the defining trait. So as soon as Drizzle Politoed dropped into OU, and Drought Ninetales, but really Drizzle Politoed, then it was... <laughs> It was chaotic, and everyone was going nuts with Swift Swim and every water abuser you could think of. So Yeah. <sighs> and I know people always kind of boil Black White down to weather generation. It is the weather generation, but just the sheer amount of things that could abuse rain, which you never saw in OU before, because previously in Gen 4, rain teams were like, oh, you set up with Lead Azel for Oxy or Bronze Iron or whatever it might be, and then like you get like four to eight turns, and it's cool and all, but now you have like Rain Dish Tentacle, and you have things like multi scale Dragonite appreciating they're, no be they're not being sand up. Or Swift Swim users, of course, but now they don't necessarily need to be like pre led by like a setup Pokemon into a Polytoad, which can provide defensive utility itself or offensive utility. And not to mention things like Rotom Wash, its Hydro Pump is now boosted by Stab. And there are just so many different combinations out there that made it a very unique. It's something that we've basically never seen before up to this point. Yeah, and that was probably for the best. But yeah, Rain was just uh, lunacy. And we'll get more and more into that, don't you worry. But let's move on from our first impressions of Earth. So, you know, Jap new Japanese-named pokes and crazy, crazy power creep to the first round of suspect testing. So this was also lunacy because we brought down a lot of Pokemon from OU, and a lot of them seemed reasonable. You know, Latios, not even a big deal at the time. And uh, Garchomp and Salamence were re-released. Uh, and uh, Manaphy at first, and uh, then we went a little further and also allowed Deoxys Attack, Darkrai, and Shaman Sky, and <clears throat> that was the first round of suspect testing, and everyone knew Deoxys was going to leave, like, right away, because, Jesus Christ, but Darkrai and Skyman, well, they were less obvious ubers because uh, another thing that changed in black and white were the sleep mechanics which were horrible uh oh, that the, yeah in my opinion yeah they they were absolutely awful <laughs> so you switch and the sleep counter resets and that's just yeah so 
everyone was thinking, oh, well, we have a million new fighting types in this generation, and Rabushin or Conkeldur has a strong Mach Punch, and Darkrai is not even that big a threat. And then Darkrai was released in OU and reminded everyone that that was a stupid, stupid idea. Yeah, so, uh, not the best combination of circumstances. People were running... Um, People were running specially defensive Lumberry Scizor to beat it, and it was it was a good check. It was, but obviously you can't switch into a Dark Void because it just Dark Voids again. And Dark Gry, of course, has the stupid quality of having bad dreams, meaning that you lose HP just for being asleep. So that was dumb. Uh, and uh, of course, Skyman. Skyman, I think, is still the only Pokemon to be banned with a one hundred percent majority. Every single person who voted uh, voted to ban it. Which, For good reason, too. It was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, which is absolutely insane because, I mean, even the most broken Pokemon, there's always a couple people who go, oh, come on, this isn't that broken. But Skyman, with its serene grace, faster than everything, Air Slash, Seed Flare, oh, gross. That was, uh, that was the worst. You'll play with OU anytime in that point and anytime in the future, honestly. Yeah. So that early metagame was where a lot of standards got established, like especially defensive Scizor. Uh, oh, Gliscor got Poison Heal from the Dream World. That was a big thing. So the standard set was uh, Swords Dance. It couldn't use Roost with Poison Heal at the time in Black and White 1. That wasn't until Black and White 2. So it was running Protect for Recovery. And Protect is actually still really good on it over Roost, but that's a later discussion. So it was running Swords Dance, Protect, Earthquake, and then Ice Fang or Facade. And uh, sometimes they would run Taunt over Protect uh, to really stick it to Skarm. That was a standard. Rotom was a standard because it destroyed Rain because it killed pretty much everything and could take some hits and burn Ferrothorn. So yeah, that was a thing. The only thing on Rain that was checking it. Yeah. And to thwart Rain, the people were running super specially defensive T-Tar with like Rocks and Pursuit and Fire Blast and Ice Beam. You know, the set that kind of makes you love running Heatran because you know their T-Tar isn't going to be checking you. So those were some standards established very early on. And uh, we saw those throughout the generation. So, uh, yeah. And then those three, the Deoxys Attack, Darkrai, Skyman were banned. And then Manaphy followed soon after because people were like, okay, you know, this is, this is dumb. The hydration thing is just it ridiculous it didn't yeah so that was absurd and then here comes the big one so the combination of drizzle and swift swim was banned and also this Alderaan's proposal, by the way, right? Alderaan's proposal the first complex ban in smogan history and this set off a wave of why can't we ban speed boost blaziken instead of blaziken as a whole and you know in the future protein greninja and whatnot so yep. <laughs> this set some scary precedents, but the basic idea was rain without swift swim is manageable, so we shouldn't be so quick to get rid of rain. I personally don't agree with this. I would have just loved to get rid of rain, but it really wasn't up to me. So, See, I come from a bit of a different ideology. I think banning rain outright would have made more sense than Aldrin's proposal because complex bans are, are just silly. Yeah, of but course. But I would have yeah. we've seen us go through the individual abusers, which might have been a longer process, or just ban the ability swift swim if we had to ban multiple abusers, but this is not uh, a video on why Finch believes X and Y about tiering decisions that happened well before he was relevant. This is just a setting history. So Aldron um, was one of the main instrumental people in making this proposal, and there was a complex ban, and it was very controversial at the time, and still is to this day, but it, it shaped how black-white tiering happened from then on out, and it did lead to the chain of events that led to the metagame we love. So I will say this, I'm, I'm happy things happened if only because now I'm such an instrumental part of the metagame that I love. Yeah, it was, I mean, Rain has never stopped being terrifying. Amazing. So, yeah. <laughs> but I will say, Specs Kingdra under Rain, under permanent Rain is one of the dumbest things ever. Three of like Ferrothorn. Oh, it was so unbelievably dumb. So, another thing that was emerging shortly after the Drizzle Swim ban was uh, Rain Stall, which isn't something you really expect, but turns out Tentacruel in Rain is one of the most hilariously broken Pokemon of all time. Oh, so, yeah. You never really can put that on other weather. Yeah. Oh, I, I hate Rain Tentacruel. If there's one Pokemon that makes me hate Rain more than anything else, 
You know, I'll take the, the Specs Hydro Pumps and the Hurricanes, but Tentacruel just makes me want to rip my face off. I hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it. If there's one reason, you know, the entire problem, let's say, with Rain is that you are at a disadvantage if you do not either bring your own Rain team or your own weather to counter it. And yeah, some people did have success with weatherless teams, but by and large, your team building choices were really, really restricted because Rain was just so powerful. And I mean, sure, you had the offensive version of this where it's like, whoops, I died a Life Orb Starmie in Rain, lol. But on the defensive side, Tentacruel is just unkillable. Like, you need to do 80% to it and not be ruined by a Scald Burn if you want to actually beat it one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. I mean, if you don't mind me giving you one example. Let's say we Please. have a Specs Latios, if you don't mind. And of course. Specs Latios is out. And Tentacruel is some special defense investment, but not a ton. So it's taking, let's say, 80-85% for Geico Meteor. It goes for Scald, and it burns. It does 20% burn. It's down to, say, 65% after self rock. Tentacruel then clicks Protect once. And it's all the way back up to 40% in rain. And all of a sudden, the Latios is at half. And the next Draco Meteor, it needs a high roll to kill. If it doesn't kill, you lose that 1v1 every single time. And that's the Specs Latios clicking a neutral Draco boosted by Specs, 130, whatever it is, special attack, etc. Versus a Tentacle clicking a resistant move off of 80 special attack. Like, I think that says it all. There's also the fact that it gets one of the most disgusting moves in the game, Scald. So your yeah. whole earthquake it thing doesn't really work because it might just burn you. So yeah, and also you can run it to be quicker than some ground types like Landorus and Exegol. So I don't even get the chance to earthquake you, which is just it's all the more reason that X exactly the tentacle rain is just absurd. It was uh, so rain stall was a thing for a while. Uh, Eternal had one. Oh yeah, uh, Undisputed yeah. had one called Rain Man, which is in the RMT archive. Those were the defining ones. And um, actually, speaking of defense, a lot of people in Gen 4, among most players, the belief was you got to have Rotom to block spin. And now in Gen 5, spinning had become so easy because of Excadrill and Starmie and Tentacruel especially. And the only real ghost was Jellicent. And, you know, people used Gengar, but it was frail. So uh, people were running spike stacking teams without even thinking about a ghost. And that was something new to Pokemon as a whole. So I thought that was really interesting because you went from uh, spin blocker every Spikes team no matter what to uh, why would I, the spinners lose to Ferrothorn and I'm just going to beat the spinners. So that really introduced a new way of thinking, a new way of playing the game. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I, I think it really highlights how... I mean, I don't want to say players evolved to black-white, but really, the metagame just kind of grew on everyone, and I think there could be other dynamics you could describe as well, but I think the one that you described there is just, it's really a great way of explaining things. Yeah, um, another thing that I want to touch on, by the way, and I know this is like a bit off the beaten path here, is hidden power in this generation was 70 base power, which is more than in the new generations, but also, there is this thing called gems, and not every Pokemon uses gems but a lot of offensive pokemon did say terrakion can run a, a rock gem stone edge or poly can run a water gem boosted hydro pump you know dragon, Our jump dragon, with dragon gem, gem outrage yeah. there are so many gems and this was another thing that power kit that i actually forgot to bring up earlier but it was so cool in that it opened up kind of how do i put this it opened up more offensive team building but it also made team building at a defensive end more scary and stall persisted as a viable play style be it through the team's eternal and undisputed made it early in you know the mid black white one stages or later on we saw some rain stall in even black white two i actually think we saw a wave of sun stall as well as recently as a couple of years back and those teams by all means are valid but the ways to disrupt those teams the ways to invalidate those teams the way to come up with even a little innovative anti-stall hita fajita whatever you want to call them text i, I don't know what term <laughs> you all use but you get the point it, it actually kind of made it so that there was a lot of ways to do that. It was Be a very rock, customizable rock, way to break through rock, stuff. Yeah. Like uh, Dragon yeah. Gem DD Dragonite no longer is really checked by Slowbro and Tangrowth and whatnot. So, uh, yeah. Do you realize how much damage a uh, plus one Dragonite does already? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Dragonite. Uh, I'm killing it. Goodbye. Speaking of Dragonite, speaking of great Dream World abilities, multi scale is just comical. Oh my goodness. And we're yes. going to get through the past suspect soon, but Dragonite, some people actually wanted to ban Dragonite. And at the time, you really couldn't blame them. It was crazy. So, 
It really was. I mean, Dragon Dance sets, in, not to mention that while Dragon Dance was the best way to use multi scale, in my personal opinion. Yeah, it but it also had a. It ran, you know, even this silly powerless plus phasing set, which I personally never thought was great, but a lot of people used and very. Oh, I remember that. Lot. Yeah, the Subru's Dragon Tail T Wave. That was yeah. so dumb, but hey, it, keep in mind, there are no fairy types, so like that set, Dragon Tail did everything for some. Action. I haven't thought about that set in at least nine years. That's crazy. No, I haven't thought of that since like 2012, but it's like there was a, one team on the ladder. It's not oh. like 8-0 to do with it. It was the most annoying. It was impossible. Uh, yeah, actually, I forgot to say with Rainstall, there was also M Dragon's Rainstall, uh, called ah. the Art of Rainstall, and that actually used uh, not a sub Dragonite. But a multi-scale Dragonite to tie everything together and wall things like Reuniclus. So it was, uh, yeah. It, Rainstall was infuriating, and it went through flux, I guess you could say, because there were some periods where it was dominating and beating everything, and then there were other points where it was just getting bullied out of the metagame. But uh, as a whole, the fact that Rainstall was a thing was just a testament to you couldn't predict what was next in black and white. It was going, it was all, every time you thought it settled even a little, then something else pops up. So, uh, speaking of things that were banned, so after Manaphy was banned, then, uh, and Drizzle Swim, then the next on the chopping block was Blaziken. And Smogan was not as big back then, but there was a lot of backlash over us banning a starter, starter. Pokemon. Yeah. And <laughs> this is around when I started this metagame. And I remember one of my first battles, I straight up lost to Blaziken because I didn't even know it got speed boost. That's how new I was. And it's just crazy because you see Blaziken, like in Gen 4, it was a really good Pokemon in UU, if I recall correctly. And... The more and more it kind of scales out of proportion with, with uh, say, Sewer Stance plus Speed Boost, for example, it's like, okay, I give Blaziken one turn, all of a sudden it has plus two attack and plus one speed. Like, how can I deal with this? My Latios is now slower than it. My um, my walls are now one shot or two shot by it, and they can't kill it in one hit return. Even with things like Rain or the aforementioned Dragonite, potentially being, I guess, soft checks to it at times, it, it's... It's too strong, it's too much, and it arguably was just as broken as some of the Pokemon that was banned in the initial wave, which is just crazy because it's a Blaziken. And like, like, Blaziken yeah, like, being oh, banned Blaziken being banned when Rain was so strong is kind of fascinating because just imagine how dangerous this fire type is that you have to ban it when Rain is everywhere. Also, it wasn't even just a Swords Dancer because it could run a, a mixed set. And bye bye Gliscor because it uses HP Ice. So, uh, yeah. Oh, and of course, a high jump kick got buffed in this generation because before it totally sucked, but now it's 130 base power and mows through everything. So. Yeah, and it was also like, for example, rain teams, they tend to have like high level tentacle, right? And you could realistically break through that core with just one or two entries of Blaziken with just like a little stealth rock, you know? So it's not the most like far fetched thing to see Blaziken actually still do successfully against those teams. You know what was actually really good around then, and was still for a while, was Azumarill. It was a lot of good players were using it because it checked like all the broken threats. Blaziken, Volcarona, Excadrill, Landorus, Terrakion, you would just Aqua Jet them into oblivion. Azumarill was great. So, uh, it, was, it was a weird, weird time because there were so many broken things and yet there was a balance. The good players were still on top. Like uh, Frankie, Frankie was one of the best black and white one players at the time. Yeah, yeah he was. Uh, he was pushing the metagame forward. He was making the most out of Landorus because at first Landorus was just like, all right, Earthquake, Stone Edge, Walled by Gliscor, and then he slaps HP Ice on it and uses a subset and Good Night, and even worse, he puts Smackdown on it over Stone Edge, yeah, and now oh now Skarmory and Rotom yeah. die to Earthquake, and it subs up and just rails your team. Wait, so. um, just to notify people, in Black White 1, Landorus Incarnate, or Landorus the regular one, it didn't get Sheer Force, it only got Sand Force. Yeah, so it was nuts. It was balanced, but it was really good, because it was so strong with Sand, and it had 101 base speed, and it just did so much, but once it got Sheer Force, not only was it good, it was just outright ridiculous. And it actually took a while for it to get banned, if I recall. It did, but we'll get there. I fought, we'll there. Uh, yeah. I fought <laughs> many battles, but... Uh, uh, yeah, so Blaziken was banned even though it dies to Aqua Jet, so how could you ban a starter Pokemon that dies to Aqua Jet? Many people <laughs> cried. Uh, so, there was that. And then there was a period of relative peace 
uh, well, oh, first of all, I gotta, we gotta talk about how the level of power was being redefined because of Pokemon like Terrakion being the norm. Because Terrakion, like Garchomp and Landorus were strong and fast, and Terrakion was stronger and faster than them. Terrakion can one-hit KO something as bulky as Garchomp with close combat, which is ludicrous. It's not a good chance, but it can. So yeah, from full stealth rock from choice pan, it's actually a decent chance, but it needs a stealth rock. But regardless, like just think about that. That is a close combat versus a guard jump, which has more natural bulk than Swamper. Yes, it does. That is yeah. ridiculous. And so it really set a new standard for just Pokemon that could come in and just blast away and not care about resists. So uh, the first guy to run choice pan Terrakion was Jabba the Griffin. I think he was a. Uh, it was him or Loco Poker Iconic who were running the specially defensive Swords Dance Scizor. So those were the guys who were on top of the metagame then. But Jabba was the guy going, look, Terrakion has Swords Dance and that's nice and all, but close combat kills everything besides Gliscor, who you Stone Edge, and then close combat kills everything. So, oh, it was nuts. It was absolutely nuts. So, but after Blaziken, there's a period of relative peace. Uh, you know, Excadrill is nuts, Garchomp is nuts, and uh, Lando's nuts, and eventually Garchomp gets banned, not because it was too strong, although it really was great, but because Sandvale was the dumbest thing ever. Uh, there were, everyone had a nightmare scenario of, oh, I missed three HP Ices on Garchomp and lost, or Garchomp beat my Skarmory because it used Swords Dance and I missed two Whirlwinds on it as it killed me. <laughs> really, really just horrible stuff. It's like, no, I can't use more 100% accurate moves. It was... Uh, here's how bad yeah. it was. Well, Garchomp and Excadrill together. Uh, there was a team called Enter the Dragon by, again, Jabba the Griffin, but also PK Gaming, who was like, hey, everyone's forgotten about Haxorus. What if I use Choice Band Outrage and a bunch of other dragons? And uh, that team used a Scarf Politoed just because Garchomp was so annoying, and also because Excadrill terrorized Weatherless. But it was mainly for ripping through Garchomp Sandvale, because otherwise sand teams like Solemn's Core, uh, the team KG was spamming, and what was the name of PDC's team? Negative, negative three, I think. So stuff yeah, like that, like uh, the Garchomp, Titar, Garchomp, Jirachi, Gliscor, Rotom Core. You know, pick yeah, your favorite filler. KG was using Sigilyph, which was funny because Sigilyph was not used by anyone else, and that didn't really take off. But the core was really strong. And that's what uh, a lot of the good players were using on their sand teams. But I always liked Frankie's approach because he was using the Terrakions. He was using the Landris. He was pushing the metagame forward with Landris. Actually, he dis he made a lot of discoveries. He discovered uh, Celebi with Nasty Plot because it resisted water and had natural cure for both Scald Burns and Rotom will o -Wisp Burns. So that he I found this great offensive-defensive use for it. And uh, his yeah. team, which I think is called Wolf Gang, it's also in the RMT archive, one of the best black and white one teams, because he found a formula for consistency on sand, because he's got the two water resists, this helps him deal with rain, and also, uh, a ba he also has a backup special check, so rain can force in his T-Tar and overwhelm it, and then he's got the two sand abusers, so it was T-Tar, Celebi, uh, Scizor, Excadrill, Landorus, and Slowbro, and that team was groundbreaking in so many ways because he's debuting Celebi, he's showing off this insanely broken Landorus set, he's abusing Excadrill of course, but that's not the groundbreaking part, and he's using Slowbro, because Slowbro is standing up to Garchomp, standing up to Lando, standing up to Terrakion, standing up to Excadrill, so it's just this monstrous, monstrous wall of a Pokemon that doesn't die because of regen, and he's abusing Sand himself, so I really like Frankie's style. And he was definitely one of the best players. Yeah, and that's think, that's the kind of uh, transition we were going through at the time, the yeah, exactly. aggressive sand. And I honestly feel like the metagame, I mean, every metagame goes through phases, but the ones in black-white, they're just so defined. Like, we could go back and we kind of categorize them as we were. There was the era where everyone was just, I don't want to say spamming broken shit, but I mean, that's essentially what they were doing, to put it bluntly. And then there's the era where, you know, back balances were developing, this, that, and other thing. And it was kind of this period where after these initial waves of bans and Blaziken got banned, there was maybe a bit of, you know, normalcy for him, but then... Yeah, it was, um, it was. If you play a metagame, if you let a metagame go on long enough, it's going to seem normal, and uh, even if there's broken stuff running around. Yeah. Um, 
are, are we quite yet at the point where people started like saying, "Oh wow, Tarakion's broken"? Not quite yet. Uh, we're still getting there. So yeah. right now we're in summer 2011, and the summer's yeah. winding down, and uh, Sandvale's gone or Garchomp's gone, Blaziken's gone, and at the end yeah. of the summer, people are like, "Okay, we've had it. Excadrill has got to go." Yeah. Excadrill was yeah. a suspect That's many times. I guess quickly we'll touch on the suspects that were some of the other ones. Dragonite was a suspect. Volcarona was a suspect. Reuniclus was a suspect, actually, because uh, everyone was using Scizor, and it would just heal off the U-turn, and it would just outlast everything else. And, you know, stall teams couldn't handle it without Calm Mind, Roar, Latias, and that had pursuit problems, and Reuniclus set up all over Pharaoh and just was bulky and strong and impossible to KO. It was very anti-meta at the time. It still is. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that would... Yeah, that was... So re those were some suspects that I remember. I don't remember any other big ones. Uh, Baton Pass was a suspect once, but that was still in its early stages. Um, let's see. So uh, then uh, people had suspected... We had suspected Excadrill several times, but people were going, oh, it's not that bad, even though... Ex Sandrush Excadrill in Permanent Sand is so dumb because it outspeeds everything and has a gajillion attack already and then it uses Swords Dance and of course your Gliscor is you know a couple it didn't have Iron Head in Black and White 1 so it had to make do with Rock Slide but even then not always enough especially because you got to hit it several times because it's got Air Balloon and uh, Rotom gets worn down sometimes people even ran Life Orb with uh, Frustration just to destroy Rotom and at the end of the it's time in OU, then people are running leftovers with Rapid Spin and really making the most out of its support capabilities. So now Skarmory, yeah, Skarmory walls it. Skarmory also gives it a free spin. You can't spin block it at all. So it was it was ludicrous. And Axio Drill forcing you to wall it and just flinching past you anyway because you can't outspeed it. And uh, another reason Azumarill was so good. But yeah, Axio Drill was banned around that time and good riddance. And banned alongside yeah, no. it was uh, Thunderous, just regular Thunderous, because there was no Thunderous Therian yeah. back then. And people always say, oh, we have Thunderous Therian, how is Thunderous Incarnate not uh, back? It's not that much better. And yeah. I gotta say, I can't agree with that view at all, because Thunderous Incarnate has 353 speed, base 111, I think. And that means it's faster than Latios, uh, Terrakion, Garchomp, and Lando I. And Thunderous T ties with Lando I and gets outsped by those other guys. And if Thunderous was in Black and White 2, then it would also be getting uh, outrun Keldeo. by... Ke it would also be outrunning Keldeo, yeah. So, uh, I don't know, man. It, it would not be good. Uh, Nasty Plot just cleaved through everything. And then there were people who were... Uh, there was also Prankster Thunder Wave, which was the stupidest thing ever. Yeah, and the three-attack coverage of Thunder, Thunderbolt, plus Focus Blast, plus Hidden Power Ice, which keep in mind is 70 base power, it made it so that you basically had to run like a Chapelberry Ground type or something ridiculous like Chansey Stall, or it just had to run an abundance of revenge clone options to keep it pressured, or you're going to lose one, if not multiple, Pokemon to it. And unlike things like Latios and Latias, it's not even Pursuit Week either, so it could potentially, like... If for some reason a uh, Tram try with like a Chapel Barrier, Troy Scarf comes in at once, it could maybe even lift to tell the tail. So it, it just made it so that on the special end, it was an immense threat. Then it also has Prankster Thunder Wave, and it's just like, oh damn. <laughs> had myself on mute there but thunders will not come back if i have anything to yeah, say about it will definitely not be coming back to black white so long as bkc and i have any influence in the decision whatsoever and yeah. that's gonna be good for me for a while so every everyone hated it it was yeah, like it, it was it, like excadrill like those two were clearly above the rest they were thinking okay you know latios and terrakion whatever are crazy but thunders and excadrill are really something else these guys need to go and, and they did when thank they god were, yeah, I mean, when they left, entered. I don't want to say like a period of the best black white we've ever seen, but it was a pretty we decent weren't period. We were quite there because we still had to get rid of Deoxys speed. Oh, and, yeah, oh, and that that right. was uh, after the Excadrill Thunderous ban. Then we dismantled the suspect testing system and established the Smoking Council. And personally, I hated this. 
because I love the system for suspect testing in black and white up until that point. The way it worked was if you play Pokemon on the ladder against the other good players in the metagame for three weeks or so, and then at the end you see what's a problem and you vote on it. So that way you're experienced. You cannot BS your way to voting requirements in that day and age. And especially with how awful the PO ladder system, uh, ra PO ladder rating system was. So you really had to be good. And you uh, to ban something, it would either have to get one super majority or two simple majorities in a row. Yeah. So uh, that's so it was a high threshold too. And I love that system. I think it's as ideal as there is for uh, tiering in Pokemon. And then that was thrown out in favor of the Smogan Council, and boy, did I uh, did I rail against their methodology for a long time. But yeah, that was I, I hated that because then we had the Deoxys speed test, and thankfully that was banned because Deoxys is a Pokemon that has no place in OU yeah, yeah. because uh, spikes and uh, the spike sets are just so dumb. And then after that. Then the metagame settled a little, and we had a really great metagame. Okay, it had flaws. In Black and White 1, Terrakion, the end product, Terrakion was crazy broken. And uh, like even stuff like Gliscor and Slowbro were faltering because... Uh, oh yeah, they can check Choice Band pretty decently. Whoops, Swords Dance, Rock Gem, Stone Edge, good night. And... <laughs> The fact that it had a sand boost, you know, it you don't think it's a big deal until it's actually taking your special attacks. So, uh, it's it was really dumb. Terrakion was dumb, and Deoxys' defense was dumb for the same reasons Deoxys' speed was. So And um, if you don't mind adding one other thing, mm -hmm. real quick. I think this is also the peak of Sand Forest Landris. Yes, I, yeah. I people, think... The smack up that with Hidden Power Rice, again, a ton of traction. People were even using things like extra belt on it to lure I love things that and set. I love right. that, that set. That dominated the Pokemon Online black and white one ladder. And this ladder, like, it wasn't the same ladder as it is now. There were that was a that great ladder. That was a very good ladder. He was on the ladder. I mean, top tournament players on the ladder. I was on the ladder as, so like, a very new player. Soul Wind on the old, like, Celebi 42, I believe. I mean, Blunder was getting started back then, etc. There were so many people that were up and coming on this ladder, and it was just amazing seeing all these great players duke it out with all these things that were very common in the metagame in the appeal ladder. So that was really fun. Yeah, around this time that Deoxys Speed is getting banned, so the fall of 2011, then players like, uh, that you know now, Ojama and McMegan, they're establishing themselves. And, you know, so they're still around today. And... Okay, so Deoxys Speed gets banned, and then we enter a good period where, yeah, there's like Lando and Deoxys and Terrakion, but by and large, it was a very balanced metagame. And so let's see, what, what happened? So first of all, oh, yeah, how could we forget? Summer 2011, a guy named Sir Azel, flattering on the alt Dark Azel, reaches number one on the ladder and holds it for like three weeks, which was absurd. Nobody could touch him. <laughs> He was running a new style of team called Volt Turn. So uh, people, he was like, hey, I can chain Volt Switch and U-Turn together forever with Scizor and Rotom Wash, and you know, I'll get rocks up, and I'm just going to beat my opponent easily. And nobody could stop it. It was ridiculously good. So uh, then Excadrill was banned, and the team took a hit because Excadrill revenge kills everything, and... Uh, it also provided rapid spin, which is good when you're spamming switch moves. So because you don't want damage taken, you want it to be dealt. So it kind of deterred the field management, and then the play style was still viable, but that specific team it just kind of fell off. Well, it actually, I was gonna say it kept being used, but it wasn't as good without extra drill. I mean, obviously, okay, that but it still got used yeah. a little bit. Uh, people were using Terrakion instead, so it was Titar, Celebi, Rotom Wash, Scizor, Landorus Incarnate, and Terrakion. And whew, what a... it was really irritating. Everyone was spamming that style of sand, and this is where I step in, actually, and I have to toot my own horn for a little bit. So I was... Uh, this was the first time I reached number one on the ladder, because I had been you know playing in tournaments, but nothing too impressive yet. And this was where I was starting to break out. So I got number one on the ladder with my rain team called Art of Ruin because I was really into Lamb of God when I was that age. And uh, it was a, I would 
play sa uh, standard sand volt turn on ladder over and over. So I lead Pharaoh as they lead Rotom. I take the burn, I get up rocks and spikes, and late game my Azumarill would clean them up every single time. So, I mean, early game I would deal with Rotom Volt switching into Terrakion and killing me, but then a late game Azrum will clean up, and that kind of led to a little bit of a shift away from the Sand Volt turn stuff, as Rain Offense became really dangerous, and uh, then there was another development uh, that I had a uh, hand in, so uh, before people were really... Uh, we're not using Choice Scarfers because of Excadrill. Because Excadrill completely invalidates Choice Scarfers. Yeah. Was, so, around this time, I was making... I was tutoring uh, Funkasaurus, and we were making a team, and uh, we wound up using Hippowdon and Scarf Jirachi. And uh, those two went from being pretty much never used to being metagame staples at the end of Black and White 1. And I was really proud of that. So... Yeah, and, that was uh, a revolutionary style at the time because no one thought. I mean, okay, Compoundon was kind of like an afterthought, and some people. Yeah. It plus Scarf Jirachi. That the way the team was structured, it was kind of novel, and it really opened the door for different different mindsets and possibilities in the metagame. Like Hippo Fortress stuff, like took over, and that was really good to see. Yeah. Do you remember the standard Fortress set around that time that people were using? No, I. I people don't were using that, Hidden so. Power Ice Fortress. Oh, 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 yes, to hit the Glyph scores and Landris yeah, and yeah. even Dragonite. Yeah, I remember that now. Yeah, so, I actually, um, yeah. I the Sandstall with Glyph score myself, and I got sniped by that in the first game, and I was like a 13, 14 year old at the time. Keep this in mind. I was so mad. I was like, why is the Fortress hidden? I had this whole yeah, like. It was nuts. So. I was like, okay, I got to change my team. <laughs> so the thing was that in uh, fall 2017, then EO was laddering with the. Uh, he came up with this Glyph score set. Which was basically a Garchomp replacement. It was Sub SD Earthquake Acrobatics with a Flying Gem, and it was a Devil. Yeah, he came up with that, and it was referred to as EO Gliscor for a while, and it was stupid for the same reasons that Garchomp was stupid. And then, um, so the, and he on the same team, he was using an HP Ice Fortress. I'm pretty sure he came up with that, although I could be wrong, but it became the standard. I still remember 36 special attack EVs. Checked Gliscor, any variant, and uh, a Poison Heal, of course, as well, uh, including the Subtoxic set that people like Ojama were spamming. Ojama terrorized people with Subtoxic Gliscor. It was... I mean, other teams could just fall flat to that set. It's yeah. going to oh. last forever. There's RPP. Toxic, if you don't have a good stat sets over, then forget about it. And Earthquake hit some of them, like, say, Tentacool or Toxic Oak as well. Not to mention hitting things like Excadrill and Tyranitar for super effective damage. So just it wasn't a good time if you didn't have something that was very much ready for a subtoxic list for. Yeah, uh, we'll get to that in a sec, but I just wanted to go on the Fortress thing. So the standard set was Spikes, Rapid Spin, Volt Switch, Hidden Power Ice, Bolt Beam Fortress. Funk used <laughs> to call him uh, the Big Sweeper because he would actually be dishing out damage on his own. Uh, so, and I really like that as a response to all the Ferrothorns uh, running around and Fortress were just set up on them and spin on them and it would it started making it so that sand was dominating rain offense a lot and uh, so while well, i mentioned the hip out on forey style then ojama had always been a proponent of bulky starmie but now he was pioneering the skarm starmie style of semi salt not, not pioneering obviously like crack had been using it before but uh ojama made it popular crack had this devastating stall team in the excadrill era it was a CB Tar Heatran, because Spadef Heatran was everywhere. How have we not mentioned that yet? He was amazing. Uh, Skarm, Tangrowth, uh, Tangro CB Tar Heatran, Skarm, Tangrowth, Excadrill, and Gastrodon. Yeah, of course. That team was beautiful. Oh, yeah. That team was absolutely gorgeous. He once, uh, Roscoe and I were once watching a Smogan Tour final, and it was a round robin. And I think he 6 0 one opponent twice with that same team. It was just... That was as one of the most perfect teams to come out of that metagame. It was ridiculous. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, I really love that one. And then Excadrill was banned. He was just like, okay, I'm replacing it with Starmie. And he kept winning with it. Crack was incredible. And... Um, yeah, it, Crack. Yeah. Right, he was so... And then uh, later on, he replaced the Tangrowth for Gliscor 
and still kept winning. That team was spammed to the end of Black and White 1, and, well, the end of Black and White 1, but even a little bit beyond. Because uh, yeah, Gastrodon... Was yeah, yeah. Okay. Gastrodon was one of those Pokemon that popped up in popularity in response to all the rain, because it was one of the few things that could actually counter Thunderous, and, of course, it didn't care for uh, any rain attacks. So... Uh, that was that was a really popular one. The core used on uh, Tab's team that Blue won the Frontier with, allegations notwithstanding. Uh, Heatran, Heatran, Skarmory, Gastrodon. That was the like good player core that was everywhere for for quite some time. And it was you know there's always that like one strategy or core or whatever that the good players are using to tackle the meta game, and that was one of them. Uh, Transcarm Gastro. I remember Ojama in the PO chat suggesting it to new players. God, we are old. <laughs> anyway. Oh my God, that's yeah. a different era. That's from back when we had like the the moderation system. People was like by the Pokeball beside your name. Yeah. And people that yeah. were like big with power on the Smogon server. Oh my goodness, I feel nostalgic right now. <laughs> and there was. Uh, do you, speaking of uh, ladder heroes from that time, do you remember Schweinsteiger? Vaguely, yes. Yeah, he was the guy with the. Um, I think he was using Ace Matador's stall team, and then he used it so much and made tweaks, and it, and it was just his. He was the guy with the Quagsire Sandstall. Yeah, and he also played, like, obnoxiously slowly at times, and his <laughs> games just took forever. Like, I you could spend remember... big one, go ahead, grab your lunch, and then come back, and it's still, like, the middle of the game, which you never saw in Black White. I don't remember that, but I remember I... The time I felt like I was officially, like, a good player was when I was finally able to beat him on ladder, as opposed to before, where his Quagsire would just wall everything and be the uh, worst. I was stuck in that. I was stuck in that mix where I just couldn't break the Quagsire plus yeah. the, the actual walls because my setup was the way to beat the walls. And it's just like, okay, this is too big brain for me. Once I could and beat him, it. then that was like my my threshold. So uh, in terms of metagame, so we've got the sand stall coming in, and bulky starting is a big development because it completely dumpstered rain stall. And that was a huge, that was a good thing, because Rainstall, nobody liked Rainstall, so... Yeah. it's a bit over-reliant on entry hazards to do passive damage, and... And it just, I mean, natural cure yeah, recovered suit. everywhere, yeah. Uh, yeah, natural cure spin, it was just like, oh, well, suddenly this, you know, makes it so that my team can't make progress, whereas they only have one slot that's dedicated towards stopping that progress, so they have five other slots to completely screw me over. Yeah, it was, Bogey Starmie came in and... Ruined everything for Sam. And then we had, of course, our Bolt Beam Fortresses and Sand Veil Gliscors and Scarf Jirachis and Hippowdons. And oh my god, I miss it. And uh, yeah, our yeah. CB, and, CB and Rock Gem Terrakions. You know what was crazy underused in Black and White 1 was Latios. It was just kind of like another yeah, Pokemon. No, actually like, it went from being one of the better Pokemon early on because of the abundance of rain in my opinion to being actually kind of under the radar. I mean, I don't think it was ever Weirdly, bad. It was so, never all yeah. really bad. But it wasn't even close to as common as it is nowadays back then. No, not not even uh, not even the same ballpark. I mean, people, people didn't expect much either. It was actually a lot of life orb, hidden power, fire, if I recall. Yeah, yeah, it, you weren't seeing a lot of specs. Uh, what else was there? Oh, Sun actually became legitimate after a while because of uh, the early French players using Doug Trio. Uh, actually, Penguin X was the first guy I saw to put Doug Trio on Sun, and then there were, of course, the French players like. Grim seventy, that guy was crazy. He had Sun with no spinner, no Dug Trio, Thunderous, and it worked. It was uh, that guy was nuts. He had a, this team called French Orgy with Beelzebub, and it won a lot in World Cup. The same World Cup where McMegan made his name, going three and zero with his team, no rain, no gain. Uh, the one with the Toxicroak. He was uh, toxic. People were using Toxic Rook before, but he showed just how scary it was. And he was using yeah. Volturn, Rotom, and Scizor because who wasn't? And Thunderous because it was crazy busted. Do you remember? Yeah, no, uh, you know, nowadays Thunderous T uses that bulky spread to sub up on Pharaoh, but you know, yeah. Blue Star was doing that as early as like 2011. Yeah, I, I it's heard crazy about to think actually. about. Oh man, we are really, Sometimes really old. Never truly <laughs> So I mean, this is years and years of uncovered history right here. <laughs> oh, I remember when Mega, what not Mega Alakazam, when just Alakazam came out and uh, was released in Dreamworld with Magic Guard, and suddenly it was like, uh oh, Scarftar doesn't outspeed every good attacker now because Scarftar, yeah. like if you weren't running uh, Rocks T Tar, then 
I remember fried rice uh, started running Scarf Tar because it checked Thunderous, uh, Lotties, Terrakion. So it was yeah. really good. And then, you know, Alakazam, and that was really good for a time, a long time. And even after Alakazam came out, everyone was using Scarf Tar because, you know, it was amazing. It was by and large the standard. But, uh, you know, th it broke the whole rule of no useful attacker can be faster than Scarf Tar. Yeah, and also, just to put it in perspective really quickly, Alakazam was either UUBL or UU before it got Magic Guard. Yeah. And once it got Magic Guard, it quickly became OU. And obviously, nowadays, it's one of the OU staples on balance teams, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and back then, it was like a good Pokemon, but not like an incredible Pokemon. So. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after a couple of years later, people were going, oh, my God, you got to ban Zam. It's so dumb. But, you know, who who would have thought? Black and White 1 was a weird time. Oh, and uh, Sun was legitimate with Dugtrio and uh, you know, a lot of Fortress. Fortress used to be so good. How times have changed. There was, um, there was this one Sun team that abused, like, Wobbuffet plus Volcarona that I faced, too. Mm -hmm. And it was the most ungodly combination it swept me every time i mean the, you're able to eliminate things like say choice scarf Tyranitar because you live a crunch you counter back or even polytoad because a lot of people were running choice polytoad at this time too um of course eventually people adapted to that and also just guava fat i mean it really only gets you one time but <laughs> still it's it was not pretty sun was diabolical at the time i remember uh world cup 2012 that was a great tournament the last big tournament with um with black and white one, you know, lots of lots of everything we've been talking about, and uh, we mm -hmm. weren't talk we haven't talked about Deoxys D. I hated that thing. Deoxys it was D weird offense. Deoxys D was ridiculously good, but it wasn't actually atop the usage. I believe it was on risk of falling to UU. Actually. It was right. UU. It actually was oh, UU. Like there were a lot of uh, there was this one great UU team. I think uh, Davy Jones was the guy's name. He uh, had a great team with it. There a lot of people were using it. In UU, and it was crazy good, and it was like, oh yeah, by the way, it's probably broken in OU, but nobody seems to care. <laughs> so, because <laughs> the OU council was just like, all right, ride it out till Black and White Two, whatever. Yeah, did it get banned during Black White Two or Black White One? I can't quite remember. Two, two, and we oh. had to fight for that too, but you oh, know. So, uh, yeah, DoD was nuts. Uh, I miss Black and White One, especially defensive Celebi uh, started rising in popularity. That was a big one, and. At first, you know who was using it first? K12 the Madsheen, because oh, yeah, yeah he was using it with Parish Song to counter Reuniclus, and then Which makes uh, sense. sorry. Which does make some sense. To be yeah, fair. yeah, that was when Reuniclus was you know, at the top of everyone's threat lists, and Absolutely. you know that was a big deal. But then LB was just great because it checked pretty much everything on Rain. You know, not Tornadus, but everything else. And it was really hard to, really hard to bring down, and uh, it was a staple on Sand. Ojama used it on his team. I used it on a bunch of teams. It just became a metagame standard. So, God, I missed that. <laughs> and um, let's see, so lots of special defensive Celebi and lots of everything. Hippo, Fori, Fori and Skarm. Either you had Fori or the combination of Skarm and Starmie. And uh, Jellicent was amazing, and Scarf Jirachi was amazing, and Heatran was crazy. Sandvale Gliscor was dumb, <laughs> but yeah, another thing that wouldn't get dealt with until Black and White 2. And uh, yeah, Sun was mildly dumb. I used it uh, to against Oceana and Stallion when uh, East oh. played them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, back when we were still making finals. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, those were the days. But yeah, we toppled the previous tyrants or the previous uh, giants in Oceana, and that felt really great. So I, I did enjoy that, and I used Sun there, much to everyone's surprise. And oh, I miss that those days. Anyway, so we should keep moving forward instead of just wallowing in how great Black yeah, and White One was. Black and White Two, actually. Yeah, we're actually right at the corner of Black and White Two, so. Black and white one was pretty balanced. I mean, yeah, you had a couple things that were dumb, but you know it was very manageable. And then black yeah. and white two comes, and oh boy! So let me see if I can remember everything that was released. You know, there was a lot of non-astounding stuff, but Conkeldur got ice punch, so you couldn't counter it with Gliscor anymore. Yep. Uh, Terrakion got Stealth Rock, so it became a really popular suicide lead. And uh, now the big stuff. 
we received Genesect, we received Keldeo, we received Regenerator Amoongus, and we of course received the three Therians. Am I forgetting oh, something? Funny. No, you're good. Okay. And so early on, our first suspect test of Black and White 2 is Sandvale, because good riddance. And this allows us to bring back Garchomp, who has just received rock, uh, rough skin from the Dream World. And that's really, really helpful, because uh, with rough skin and rocky helmet, and it's uh, Volt Switch immunity, it breaks up Volt Turn. You know, people in Black and White 1, I can't emphasize enough, they hated Volt Turn. They wanted it banned. So... Uh, Garchomp pretty much put an end to that almost on its own, which was pretty impressive. And so Sandvale was banned, and we had to argue with people who were arguing, Sandvale Garchomp's not broken, Zoom Lens Slowbro is very likely to hit Ice Beam against it. Hmm. No, I'm serious, that was a real thing, by the way. I, I really? I'm kind of surprised, I must admit. Um... I don't know, I'm 1,000% serious. Remember the whole thing where we talked about people defending stuff that really shouldn't be getting defended? Uh, yeah, this is a prime example of just that, as you're outlining. That's perfect. And people were going, why do you want to ban Sandvale? Sandvale Gliscor is not such a big deal. And then there were like 15 people coming in. It's like, look, if you watched World Cup, you would know Gliscor is dominant. It's It destroys everything. And just because it's not Garchomp doesn't mean it's not Banworthy, and they were just like, lol, not Garchomp, so... Yeah, it might not be Garchomp, but it still has... No, it was, it was absurd. Sandvale, so, yeah. the score was terrifying. Sandvale, anything that's that good of a Pokemon is just... EO no, topped the no ladder using that. Cacturn. Yeah, that does not surprise me. That's a very EO that, thing The to team do. he made with, um, with the HP Ice Fory and the origin of that Gliscor, it had a Cacturn. So, of course it did. Yeah, because why oh, wouldn't it? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, early Black White 2, we banned Sandvale. We bring back Garchomp, which was good because Garchomp without Sandvale was not really broken. Sandvale, of course, on it was just ridiculous. And then, well, I'm going to let you talk about this, but we decided instead of dealing with the 16,000 broken things we had on our plate, then we decided to test an Uber. Because why not? And we brought down Kieran Black, so take it away. Well, see, Kieran ba Black initially was banned. Unlike some other ridiculous things like Tornado's T. And, you know, I can't even get mad at that because who knows what's broken and what's not broken. It's, it's hard to examine from a raw point of view. But everyone's like, oh, Kieran Black's ridiculous has like 170 plus attack. Plus, the defenses are really good naturally. Not to mention there's like 130 special attack. In, in speed, okay, maybe a little underwhelming, but... Choice Band Outrage, you know, there are no fairy types. It can 2 kill things like Ferrothorn with Outrage if they're an especially defensive set, which at the time, a bit less common than it is now, but still it was used here and there. So you're like, you know, how is Churn Black going to be manageable? But then, then, it, it got retested, and crazily enough, it was it was okay. People actually didn't even use the Choice Band set at first initially. There was a set with Ice Beam plus Fusion Bolt plus either Earth Power or Rooster, Hidden Power Fire. We, we saw a whole slew of different moves that was used. And it was always a good Pokemon, at times bordering between like B plus and A rank in viability, but it was never broken. And to this day, I still don't believe it's broken. Nowadays, people are at least using the set that I believe to be best, the Choice Band set. But the fact that it matters with Kieran Black is that it fit into these team archetypes that we saw, and there were good teams, but things like Kieran Black, it only really got in one or two times, despite having great natural bulk, weak to Stealth Rock, taking Sand Damage, weak to Spikes. The toxic spikes if you see them here and there and because of that coupled with the fact that things like Latios, again Terrakion, all of the genies etc outrun it besides the outlanders t which although it could be running scarf but the scarf didn't actually develop that much at that time but that's neither here nor there it, it made it so that Kieran black actually kind of despite being one of the most overwhelming offensive presence itself got overwhelmed by this hectic madhouse of a black white metagame now if you want my honest opinion I think the retest timing was kind of crazy because the metagame had a lot of problems, but... I, I absolutely it, agree, because it, I don't it think... It, it kind of did work out, so... Yeah, I don't think okay. Kieran Black is broken in Black and White. You'd have to be crazy to actually think that. 
But I yeah. think it should have been tested when the metagame was in a less tumultuous period. Yeah, it could have been another year. Let or me list everything. Just... Yeah, let me list everything that is now banned that was in the tier at the same time as Kyrim's ban. Genesect, Tornadus Therian, Landris Incarnate, Deoxys Defense, and Keldeo also, which was suspected twice and didn't get banned, unfortunately, but that's a later topic. Um, oh, speaking of Kyrim, I want to mention that sub roost Kyrim, regular Kyrim, was becoming a thing because uh, Black and White 2 gave it roost, so it was really annoying for a lot of Sandstall teams. But yeah, so uh, Kyrim Black was. Yeah, obviously it's not broken, but it was just like more of a kick in the face for defensive stuff, which you know was getting by barely because Landris Incarnate was the most unholy abomination ever unleashed upon the world, and uh, with sheer force it was I can't uh, like I was uh, using it in one of the early Black and White Two tours, and I was just dropping things left and right like Okoing full HP Pharaohs with Focus Blast, and yeah, I remember specifically. Iconic was going, BKC, is that modest? And I was like, no, it's timid. It was oh, ridiculously, ridiculously powerful. So and I mean, there are walls, like, for example, things like Slowbro or mm -hmm. Gastrodon, which, generally speaking, you're like, oh, yeah, these do well against these ground types, like Garchomp or Landris. And nope. Yeah, normally none of that. they do, but Earth Power is doing 65, 70%, you're like, oh, well, that's... Yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was truly <laughs> absurd. Uh, and, yeah. you know, everyone was using specially defensive Celebi to counter it, and uh oh, it gets U turned, so goodbye, <laughs> Celebi. Yeah, not to mention sometimes people went Glyph like, oh, it's not hidden power, it's hidden power ice. Yeah. And I mean, even even fringe moves like Psychic we saw here and there. Oh, it's um, it uh, so sweeps with rock polish, so you can't even necessarily outspeed it. Yeah. Oh, what a, yeah, what a dumb, dumb it Pokemon. It was like a Genesect equivalent guessing game around Landris. Oh, yeah. Uh, Landris wasn't even the most broken thing around because yeah. we had not one, but two things more broken than it in Tornadus Therian and Genesect. I cannot oh believe people defended Genesect. I truly cannot. It was... Oh, and not to forget, these Pokemon formed course with the trio, which were virtually oh, yeah. impossible. Yeah, of course. Because they weren't good enough. Genesect, I... <sighs> it was literally killing... Everything besides Heatran, who was, of course, vulnerable. People were running Shed Shell Heatran to handle Genesect, and everyone was just like, lol, yep. that's fine. Uh, I realize I'm saying lol a lot, because I can't describe the stupidity yeah, of people. The power is the sheer ignorance of people who defended these Pokemon. People were look, suggesting Rotom Heat as a method of handling Genesect and Tornadus Therian. You know, those Rotom Pokemon that spam U-Turn. The Pokemon yeah. that spam U turn, and you should counter them with a Stealth Rock Week Pokemon because good. Yeah, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. So Genesect was comical. It had uh, the scarf. It's freakish to think about how broken it was with a scarf set of all things. Because, you know, who's yeah. broken with it, scarf? It picked off skills and it outran everything. It was like playing. Because it has well, download, which is. Yeah, it's download. Like playing a team. It's just not fair. You picked off kills every other turn. And then, of course, it when it switches moves, it's even worse. Like, uh, people were running Expert Belt, and then they were yeah, running Focus Sash. When when it started running Sash, it was really dumb because, oops, it just stayed in on Keldeo and Torn and Landorus and killed them back. And, uh, what a dumb Pokemon. And then, of course, the nail, or the straw that broke the camera up its back was Rock Polish. And I, w I think it would have been brand banned even without Rock Polish, but yeah, the Rock... Belt were enough to ban it, but then when people started to use rock polish, like, we gotta speed this process up, get the hell out of here. Yeah, rock polish made it undeniable, so that if you if you were anti Genesect ban at that point, then people knew really not to take you seriously. So Pretty yeah, much. Genesect was horrible, 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 yeah, horrible. Suspect I ever participated in too. I, think I was so happy. To the meta game where Kiram was tested, and you, we had Genesect and Torn and everything else running around that remains the most unpleasant, unplayable metagame I have ever experienced. It was yeah, really was a thing of wonder. It, it was actually impressive just how unbearable it could be. Because there was just so much broken stuff around every corner, and we were just like, let's throw more on the pile. Oh, yeah. I'm still salty about it. So, Genesect went, and then Torn Therian and Keldeo were... Uh, tested together, and Torn Therian, you know, in the newer gens, it runs Assault Vest and, you know, bulky defog stuff. Can't wait for it to come to Gen 8 with Nasty Plot and Boots. I really can't. But I, uh, 
I, but Ooh. in Gen Five, it was just <laughs> sorry. You're evil. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> then in Gen Five, so it was slightly weaker than regular Torn, but it was also really fast. And remember when we said yeah, Zam? Sorry. It was also bulkier, which actually helped on a couple of occasions it as did. well. But it did. But the main yeah. thing was that it was really fast, which means once again it cannot be checked by Scarf Tar. Regular Torn, sure, Scarf Tar checks, but mm -hmm, yes. not Torn Therian. It's fast, and you can't even wear it down with Stealth Rock because it actually gains HP for switching into Stealth Rock. So you could feasibly run a Stealth Rock weak Life Orb Pokemon and not have it get worn down. Which was just comical. It would outlast its answers, it would trap them with Dugtrio. But even without Dugtrio, in case anyone gets any ideas, well, well, now that Dugtrio's banned, well, can't we bring it back? No, we can't. Unless you like having your Rotom outlasted really, really easily. Yeah, yeah. Awful, like, awful, awful. Rotom Wash plus Heatran plus Tyranitar, and those teams still got eviscerated yeah. by a uh, well played Tornado's T with. Fighting plus flying plus U turn. The Just fact, those three. That, the fact that rain teams could use all of Genesect and Torn Therian and Keldeo on the same team kind of blows my mind a little bit. Yeah, I, I'm with you there. Yeah. Oh, another thing we uh, another thing we forgot to mention was Technician Breloom being released in Black and White Two. That was a big one. Yeah, Technician Breloom Poisonio sets were very viable in the Black White One Man game. In fact, at times they saw lots of usage, but. While this remained the case in Black White 2, Technician took the forefront of the usage. People such as like Ramity especially really experimented with a whole plethora of sets and it was a really threatening Pokemon. I mean, we saw Fighting Gem, we saw um, Light Orb at times. We even saw uh, a couple Choice Band Breloom and nowadays we see that even more of Spore's Band, but with Spore in conjunction with Boosted Mock Punch, Bullet Seed doing a ton of damage to it, killing things like Rio Nicholas and even Landorus Team Gliscor potentially, it just goes without saying that Technician Balloon was a force to be reckoned with as well. Thankfully, I, I don't think it ever reached like those broken levels, but it was always very good, and there were times it was considered the top ten or so Pokemon. So, do you remember when the Fighting Gem set came out? Yeah, this like it was Sword Dance Spore, Fighting Gem Bullet Seed. No, 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 no. no. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I meant uh, Focus and, Punch Fighting Gem. Oh, oh yeah. no, no, yes, that, that like you switch your Skarmory and you take like eighty percent. You're like oh, more. That's, you, that's, you switch your Torn or your yeah. Lottie in, and it just dies. Oh, yeah, it just I didn't even need to mock punch it, especially if Roxy, it just dies on the spot. Yeah, and even if you did survive the Fighting Gem Focus Punch with Rocks up, then there's also mock punch just to really make sure you yeah, didn't. Right. The game just ends for your counters. So, uh, when, when I think about just how many crazy things were around back then, it you know, it's the kind of thing that to the players of the metagame, then they managed to deal. But if you, the way we're talking about it, it was chaos. And in a way, it really was. And well, I don't know, we, we found a way, but it was not my idea of a good time. So, no, not then, either. And I'm, it's funny because we saw people try to adapt. Like, for example, Hugo started this wave of Celebi again, I believe, if mm -hmm. I recall correctly. Might be uh, a bit after no, Celebi kept made. going. Celebi kept, uh, no, had but started. People were using it more on, you know, sand teams or their own rain teams kind of as a way to check for loom, but then it became a mind game. If you spore it and then you stay in on an attack, you can get whittled down, but if you switch out and sleep something else, it's annoying. Yeah. And it just became this whole <laughs> dynamic that it wasn't the most healthy. Black and white sleep was so unbelievably dumb. Yeah. How did I'm it so take us so long to ban it? Oh my god. Jabba yeah. in fall of 2010 was like, all right, guys, let's ban sleep. And everyone was like, oh no, come on, it's just dark right. We'll get rid of dark right and it'll be fine. And little did people know. Uh, so Torn Therian was banned. Keldeo was not banned, which was a mistake. I maintain it to this day. But we'll get more to that on Keldeo's second suspect. Uh, then for a while it was fairly peaceful. Then I, I'm not sure if Landorus or Deoxys went first, but I remember the, no, Deoxys definitely yeah. went first. De and Deoxys went first because people were so like hesitant to ban Landorus. Cause like it's Landorus and Black White One was like a stable Pokemon. We don't want to ban it. They there all, definitely like, so is a thing Black called uh, a new toy syndrome. Like yeah. in Gen 4, Garchomp was so comically broken and yet people were like, oh, come on, we can't ban Garchomp. It's a new Pokemon. Landers here. Yeah. yeah, I'm with you. Tyler. So people and were it, defending it. it. Up and banned it, but it took way too long. It should have been banned with Tornadus T, honestly, instead of I any, think the Deoxys but 
They all were broken. People unironically cited the fact that Focus Blast is a 49% chance to hit twice in a row as a reason why Landorus was not broken. Yeah. Well, it, it would, it, people would actually say, you can switch in uh, Rotom to take one Focus Blast, and then it's probably not going to hit the next Focus Blast. And even if you even if you only go for one Focus Blast to switch out, you're still doing like 60% to it. And yeah. At that time, it didn't run specially defensive fan split as often. It actually became a set in black-white, like late black-white 1 or early black-white 2, if I recall, because people started pivoting around like things like Tornado's T. Oh, but, you know what was um, very anti-metagame, actually? Uh, I was playing Brofist in the fall of 2012, you know, during the chaotic metagame. And he had this amazing team with um, Protect Breloom, you know, not a technician, because everyone was using yeah. technician. And he's just like, okay, I protect, now you can't spore me anymore, and I spore you back. It led off against Genesec, because it could take a hit and spore something. It was a great team, and then I tweaked it with him, after he 6 would me with it in a test. And then I was like, oh, we gotta change the Heatran for Hippo, because... Uh, we're gonna lose to Sun. He was like, oh, good call. And this team was wonderful. I hope he hears... I'm gonna make sure he hears this, actually. Oh, yeah. It was uh, Special Defense Hippo, because Hippo, once again from Black and White 1, just was a trooper. Took everything. Shrugged off Latios like nothing. Uh, Special Defense of Skarm, and here was where it started going into the anti-metagame phase, because in Black and White 1, you had Physical Defense Skarm, because Lando... Physical Lando, Tarak... And yep. there was not really a reason for special defense. And in Black and White 2, it shrugged off Torn T. It wasn't, mainly Torn T, it wasn't instantly afraid of, like, a Genesect or Keldeo. And it was mainly Torn T. <laughs> That's how big a deal it was. And then we had the bulky yeah. Starmie, the Breloom, and then the 1-2 punch. The Scarf Genesect, because broken, and the Rock Polish Lando, because broken. I loved using that team. That's what, uh, it carried me to my yeah. first Smogan Tour playoffs. Yeah, no. That sounds and pretty badass for me. You know what was actually really good in the Torn meta as well, very anti-meta game, was uh, Zapdos. It was, because... Yeah, that's where it was pretty solid, honestly. It was really good. Penguin X had this great stall team with it, and I had it on one of my favorite teams as well. And it was great because it resists Torn all day, and yes, Stealth Rock weak, but you can't actually force it out that easily with Rain because nothing takes electric moves besides Ferrothorn, who is, of course, blackened by Heat Wave. So yeah. Yeah, Zapdos was great. That was a nice adaptation to the meta. And, uh, okay, so Torn is gone. Keldeo is still around. Deoxys is getting banned after much debate with yeah, people. Clarify, but yes. <laughs> I mean, I was just glad to see it gone. Uh, yeah. you know, people, like people were saying, oh, well, CB Tar Oko's it, so just use CB Tar. It's like, yeah, okay, that's missing the point, but sure. And uh, so yeah, then, I agree with you. So then uh, Hugo, or Great Astor, debuts HP Bug Celebi. Or not HP Bug Celebi, sorry, HP Bug Keldeo. Expert Bug Keldeo. Expert Bug Keldeo with HP Bug. So now Celebi is toast. Keldeo and Landris are ripping everything up with pursuit for Jellicence, and Lotties can barely handle them themselves, and Titar's always there, and Sand Offense is everywhere at this point. Yeah. Sorry, distracted. And, sorry, oh, go ahead. Point, yeah, go ahead. Uh, honestly. It was weird because the metagame kind of went through the shifts of, I mean, let's go back to Black White 1 for a second. It was, you know, broken, very broken, then balanced, then very broken, then very balanced. And each time, once the metagame kind of finds a, 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 a default place, a place where, okay, we could go away for suspects for just a little bit, it, it defaults to this sand balance or sand built the offense, which nowadays we still kind of refer to as a norm. But this was kind of like, I want to say like a brief second golden age before we maybe had the weather... I guess a bit of another storm, if you will. Uh, uh, I gotta disagree Keldeo. with you there. I hated the really? Lando metagame. I really, I actually, really hated it. I actually thought that for a while, Landris was really the only problem, and while it was centralized around it, at least everyone kind of accepted that fact. And we also saw things like Ladio started to finally grow back into popularity, for example, and Rotom Watch was, you know, pretty good. Celebi was around, although Celebi was kind of tormented by Keldeo, which we'll get to in a bit. And I thought this was... I, I thought this was the second best part of modern black white when it was like black white behind late black white one in my personal opinion you could disagree of course yeah i mean that's fair people i mean there are some people who love every metagame of black and white the lunatics that they were oh so not. Uh, I can't yeah i i really didn't like that 
So, but yeah, uh, then Lando was banned, and that was when I felt it settled into a good place. Once Lando was banned, then I was like, okay, it's manageable now, because Lando was the last, like, freakishly powerful thing. Everything else was doable. Like, Keldeo I still think is dumb, but it's doable, whereas Lando was just like, hope you're running screaming hyper offense with 16 priority moves. So... Pretty much. Yeah, Lando, Lando was really dumb, but, uh... I remember when Lando was banned, one of my favorite moments it was bringing my stall team to World Cup, even though everyone was expecting it, and it worked. And uh, <laughs> that was a lovely moment. So, uh, let's see, what else was there? Yeah, so, Lando was banned, and people were going, well, you know, it can't run everything, and it's like it doesn't need to run everything, because there are, like, two counters to it, and those counters, it can either beat itself or just trap and then thankfully it was gone and uh, so then Lando's right. gone and then we enter a period of relative prosperity I think it it was a pretty good time so See, this was a point in time where I felt like it took a while for the metagame to truly gain an identity because we went through this phase where there was like these Celebi Rain teams that I saw a lot of because Rain was trying to re-identify itself after a lot of bands very and true, Sand, very was true. Kind of, yeah. Sand was kind of trying to like Flirt with all these different things because now there's like a no landers to use, but also b no landers to really counter. And I just I felt like the tier kind of missed having that like anchor that centralized everything. And I know it's a weird thing to say because all those anchors up to now have been ridiculously broken and rightfully banned. But to me, there was like a, a three to four month period where it took a while, but then eventually it, it became all right. No, I know exactly what you mean. And that kind of that dynamic you just uh, mentioned is kind of emblematic of black and white as a whole so yeah, honestly yeah. so I, I know what you mean there i personally liked it because my stall team was good again now that the stupid broken landers was gone so <laughs> yeah but i know what you mean like sand offense had its phase like with these offensive jirachis that were everywhere ojama was using a ton of weatherless offense and i really liked that because yeah. he blitzed now through the problem oh, sorry let me just finish um, yeah. He blitzed through the problem of whether it was being bad against Rain by using Specs Keldeo and KOing Tenacruel and Ferrothorn with Rocks Up. So I thought that was, uh, I like that. And then yeah, uh, Healing would... Wish on Scarf Jirachi started becoming popular. So I, like Sand and Weatherless Offense was getting more and more traction and Rain was becoming worse and worse as a whole. And Sandstall was good. So as a whole, I was pretty content with the metagame. Uh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, a whole wave of predominantly European players, as you alluded to, used these kind of new wave offensive builds that were meant to counter the norms of the metagame. So they kind of, for they, they were able to forego maybe having a hard count in everything, or like a formal check to things like Tentacruel, or maybe even just rain kind of spam of offensive rain in general. But they, they traded that off for being able to beat them offensively. We saw things like Latios and, as you mentioned, Keldeo a lot more, or even Rotom Watch on these teams. But also, we saw some other things here and there, like Trunk Room Rio Nicholas, or even various Dragonite sets on these teams as well. And especially in like the higher portion of the ladder, and this was like the heyday, the golden day of the Black Bike 2 ladder, before it eventually started to go downhill, in my opinion. Um, and I, I just think it was really kind of, it, it's where Black Bike kind of hit its stride again basically is what I'd say, because there was a lot of room for creativity, innovation. The metagame really developed a lot, almost at like an OLT pace for a current generation, if that makes sense to you guys, that are from the more newer generations. I know what you mean, yeah. And uh, so, But I do agree that the metagame kind of lost identity for a while, and there were only like a couple people who were really interested in it, because a uh, consistent cry throughout the generation even by the players of the tier where black and white sucks. Everyone, I have never seen a current generation of OU as maligned and hated by the majority of the player base as I have black and white. And I've been around for a lot of them. That everyone, is so everyone. Hated more than SS right now, which is somehow possible. <laughs> Sorry, say it again? Even hated more so than Sword and Shield is oh, right absolutely. now. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. A lot of people dislike Sword and Shield, but you guys got to realize, like, it was almost a universal opinion. Like, if you were to pull 20 random, like, noteworthy players, I I'd say anywhere from 15 to 19 of them would have said, oh, I do not like this. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The only players I remember who really liked the metagame were, like, new players. Because the majority of great Black and White 1 players were, the vast majority, in fact, 
were disappointed. were uh, previous DPP players, and then Black and White yeah. Two came around, and a new wave of players came over from PO, the IDM guys, and uh, that's when there was a big culture change in Smogan. So you had a lot more shit talking and uh, showboating. out, out showboating, sh- exactly out yelling <laughs> the other guy. Uh, yeah. It was. It became more and more about the spectacle rather than the game itself, which I was not a huge fan of. But yeah, it was not a welcome change for a lot of people but, who had been around. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it definitely was a departure from some norms. Mm-hmm. That coupled with perhaps a bit more of an aggressive take on playing the game itself as opposed to just commentary. But we saw guys like CTC who happened to actually, in my opinion, push forward the Black and White 2 and XY meta games quite a bit. And before he became more of a relic, was actually a very good player in his prime. But he also had this somewhat antagonistic attitude that, I mean, it definitely pushed people the wrong way. So it created a bit of a division. But this also did lead these new players flowing in, bringing their ideas. It also helped kind of simulate the metagame in a sense. So it wasn't all bad. And I don't want to say the attitudes are bad because, you know, that's your opinion. I'm not here to please that. But rather, I, I think what's most important is the metagame fell perhaps into different hands whereas some other people might have taken a more bit of a back seat or they weren't as interested immediately but it was still slowly evolving yeah it was like a passing of the torch because yeah. like the the dpp players who turned into black and white players they were great and then once black and white 2 came around they were just like all right i've had enough and then the new wave of players came in but at the same time like even this new wave of players a lot of them were going like the people who said oh i like the metagame even they were mostly a minority because even guys like CTC, they're like, oh yeah, this thing is broken. We got to ban this thing. So yeah. when black and white uh, no longer was the main generation, people like stopped caring about it so, so, so fast. Like people had a hard time letting go of Gen 4, myself among them. And uh, <clears throat> people loved Gen 6 even after Sun and Moon came out. But when XY came out, Black and White was, you know, good night. And I was among them, because I didn't like the metagame, really. I mean, I was okay with it, but I was... As soon as the last season of Smoke and Tour with uh, Advanced DPP Black and White finished, I was like, okay, I never have to play Black and White again. And I, you know, welcomed that, because I just really didn't like what it was. Uh, especially when Keldeo did not get banned a second time. I really thought that was a mistake. And to this day, I think we could remove Keldeo and everything would be fine, but I recognize that it's not realistic. But yeah, the reason why Black and White had a bit of an identity crisis was that it had a lack of a dedicated player base because everyone who played it when it was the main gen was so happy to get away from it once it was no longer the main gen. So it just kind of meandered along with just like... You could count the amount of players who really liked the tier and were involved in the tier on one hand. So it had a stage of not really much development and just kind of weird teams, not very good teams, for, um, I don't know, I would say about close to a, close to two years. I would say around a, around a year and a half at least. From uh, late 2013, post Keldeo non-ban, right through, let's say, SPL 6. I think after SPL 6, then it started developing a little. But before that, end of SPL 6, when Reuniclus and friends were coming back, then that's when Black and White started to... It didn't just start developing, but it really gained an identity. Whereas before, it was just a mess of... And like, there were guys like Ojama, Abidi, even McMegan, and I guess you, very outspoken about different aspects of Magic Guard, um, the eventual unbanning of Exodus, etc., which we're going to get to, don't worry. And I, I feel as if this identity kind of, it just it showed what people were thinking, what was really good. And I mean, some people like Ojama and Heights, as I alluded to, took it to really outrageous levels to so using even three or four psyche types with you know, this obnoxious synergetic scheme to lure for each other and just completely ignore previous norms, which was really cool, but also very disruptive. Uh, it was really strange because it felt like Rain, of all things, had no identity. And we had a lot of yes. weird Rain teams, a lot of weird sand and 
Like, the established sand teams were still around, but it just felt like there wasn't much quality control in the teams being circulated around. So black and white was just kind of... The only real development in 2014 was that Sweepage came up with Scarf Landorus. And that was a great, great yeah, set. That turned out to be huge, but it actually didn't become huge until it took off in XY, honestly. No, that's true. This was... Uh, 2014 was after XY came out. And yeah, so uh, he, he came I, up with it. I want to explain a concept to the viewers really quickly, if that's okay. Sure, Sometimes please. Sometimes trends happen in generation... Say, let, let's say we're in generation A. Sometimes in generation A plus one there's a trend that comes out with a Pokemon that was in Generation A. And then all of a sudden, that trend trickles down to the Generation. And this was the case for Landorus T's running in Scarf set, because in XY, Scarf Landorus T was an amazing early pivot. It checked so many things. So then all of a sudden, in black-white, people started using Landorus T more and more and more. And it actually had been used very sporadically beforehand. But all of a sudden, it was like one of the best Pokemon and best revenge killers. And it, it saw a ridiculous amount of usages, usage for four or five years. And honestly, it's still seeing a lot of usage. So I, I think that's a really cool dynamic. And Black White has still been very lively over the last you know, number of years as we're gonna, again, get into it, this history lesson that we're basically going through here. But this is one of those examples of that being the case. I absolutely agree with uh, how newer gens can influence older gens. Like, uh, and, and often, no, an often unknown example is how offense of Suicune in Generation Four prompted offense of Suicune usage in Generation Three after the fact. And there are a lot of examples. Like people like to say that Clefable popped up in Gen Three in Gen Four because of Gen Six. I think maybe, but as a whole, that's not necessarily true. But the general idea is solid. You see a lot of stuff like. Uh, I see a lot of stuff carry over, like, oh, Protect is really good in X Gen, and we're going to go back to the earlier gens and apply it like that. So uh, I think you're right on the money about that. So, But yeah, as a whole, 2014, the only metagame development that really was, was that, uh, well, B Scarf Landorus. Nothing else really changed. It was just this kind of passive rumbling through the metagame and there were some people well, trying out new stuff one but... thing that in my opinion changed actually sure there was a lot less celebi the celebi started to yes decline that's true decline. that's true but yeah. celebi had already declined because of the that's whole true. hp bug thing but in 2014 yeah. it was just completely gone yeah so. it fell off so and then 2015 came around and by the end of the tournament then reuniclus spikes had made a furious comeback and uh, then people were like, okay, well, Sun is really stupid with Dugtrio and whatnot. And oh. then this was actually where you uh, burst onto the scene in a big way in black and white. Actually, no, you had uh, joined you had joined uh, the fray in the fall of 2014 when you made Smoking Tour playoffs and beat McMegan in black and white. Yeah, I was using a bit of a weird team structure. My building, my play and my meta knowledge were fun. My building was still a step behind the top players at that time. But then within the next year... Um, between a good run in SPL 7 and other tournament runs. I, I went 2-2 in World Cup prior and had a really lame game against Shoka because I missed a rock move against a Moltres with a Scarf Balloon. I will forever be salty about that, but let, let's not get carried away about that. We'll, um, we'll get there. Well, that, well, my we'll point was there, more yeah, that... Um... There, was, there was kind of a stretch of time where I, I came out in the scene of Black-White, and I'd definitely been following it for a number of years prior, but this is when I really like understood like, okay, this is black, white, this is what's going on in the meta game. And that's like when I really felt like it became a higher level player. Yeah. I remember, um, yeah, this was like when you first started really establishing yourself as instead of that guy who's around as one of the like black and white players, you were, you and Jirachi who got his uh, shot in SPL six, then yeah. you guys were, and, uh, then you were like, okay, black and white is starting to have an actual player base again. Because like you said, your team against McMegan was kind of, you know, funky-ish. But that was the thing at the time, what we've been talking about, that it really didn't, you know, it almost didn't Nothing matter in a sense. Matter. Because the tier's identity was so, it, it was so deprived of an identity to begin with. And, you know, it felt like, again, quality control, there really was none. It was just kind of like, well, this, this, I don't know. And then in 2015, end of SPL 6, uh, Reuniclus Spikes is really, really powerful. And it feels like SPL 6, especially toward the end, started giving the tier identity again. And then especially because right before World Cup, then Ojama proposed that we bring back Excadrill and we get rid of uh, Chlorophyll. And that was yep. a big, big change. And then even you know, if you disagree with the decision, the then after that... Yeah, after that, then the metagame really did start to gain some identity again. 
and so you know it kind of everyone was kind of glad to be rid of black and white and then they waited some time and then they came back and it was like yeah, okay yeah well this this isn't so bad and I mean there was still a lot of stuff to come but it was a start so uh, did you agree with the chlorophyll ban? Yes. Yeah. Um, cool. The initial one, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 2015. Yeah. I agreed with that. In fact, I believe I, I was part of that vote. That was like my first true vote. And I was heavily in favor of that. And I actually posted support. But if you want me to be honest, in hindsight, I support it in part, but not in full anymore, if that makes sense. Expand. So the thing is that I was new to tiering policy, understanding precedent, and what leads to what. And if I could do it all over again, I think I would have proposed a more of a uniform solution where we work towards banning abilities instead of combinations. And that wasn't the right step. But also, I wish if we did that, because it left some inconsistencies in the tiering, I wish that we also could have revised Auburn's proposal and just made Black White closer to where it was today, beyond the whole trapping abilities thing, which we'll get to in a bit. And I think that we could have taken like two steps or three steps there instead of one. But also, then I think that combining it with the freeing of Exedrill and other things like that that was in the near future, it was also, it just was a very hectic kind of scattered time. I feel as if it could have been done in a bit more of an optimal, maybe less rushed fashion at the time. But me being someone who at the time was 16 years old and like ecstatic to see developments in this metagame that was an old generation metagame that I felt could use improvements. And that was kind of unprecedented at the time. This was like the real first step in changing old generation metagame, if you will. Uh, um, stuff that kind of that development is what led to the old generations council to begin with. Yeah, and courtesy of yours truly, actually. Wink, was, wink. Yes, and <laughs> what I wanted to do was I wanted to get involved with that because I saw this potential, but it just it felt like the mechanisms we had to change old generation chairs at the time it was arbitrary and suboptimal, and I think the end result was ultimately pretty damn good, but. The first, the first kind of dealings in old generation tiering, it maybe could have used some, you know, irony out if that makes sense. But moreover, eventually, BKC, me, Eo, Mortis, eventually McMaggie, and eventually Ojama, um, Drachi was on there for a while. Dice has been on there too. Um, we all formed the Black and White Overuse Council, and BKC has also been on DPP. Um, I think you were on ADV and GSC as well. Yeah, I but was. Yeah. Regardless of that, we formed this, and the Black White Council has been very active, at least prior to this year. In yeah, that's because uh, this year Black there's Black. not really anything left to... Yeah, there's nothing yeah. left to do. We finally hit that point of, hey, maybe we're good, although some people want to touch Latios. I don't love that. But we'll we're get not to that. that right yeah. Now. Yeah. We'll get to that. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, this was like the start of black and white 2.2 if that makes sense because yes that's a great way to put it the black and white metagame has evolved a ton over the last three or four years and this is more than in my opinion any other old generation i'm familiar with has for example Uras has shifted in viability in trends a lot since this came out but it's not nigh Uras, unrecognizable to where yeah, it was a couple years ago Uras, black white the generation before it has probably changed more than Oras has Oh, lot. absolutely. It's not even close. Oris, yeah. even if you took a team from 2016 and put it into today's Oris, it would still be pretty similar looking. Whereas today's I mean, black and white compared to... Five, with Magnezone, because Magnezone took a team of huge uptick in usage, but that aside, yeah. I, I mean, it, yeah, obviously, if you take a team from back then and put it now, then yeah, it's going to not be as good. But the idea is that... It's not that it's uh, still viable, it's that the Pokemon and the team compositions are not completely alien. Yeah, concepts are still the same. Yeah, whereas in black and white, we've seen overhaul after overhaul. So, yes. uh, so 2015 was a turning point. And I liked uh, the change that were going on in the metagame. We saw a lot of Hydreigons, a lot of Slow Kings. I mean, in between the whole Magic Guard nonsense. To the point where in yeah. Smogan Tor, uh, McMegan brought Reuniclus and Duosian on one team. I think I have that replay okay. in here somewhere. That was pretty nuts. <laughs> and uh, that, that's just how far people were willing to take it. But, and a Heist, of course, had his Rocky Chomp, Skarm, four Psychics team with two Lotties, Zam, and Reuniclus that he won, with, uh, won against with Ojama. So. That was one of the craziest games of Black White history, in my opinion. Yeah, just yeah. in terms of the sheer team choice and the two players of those names. Right? It's it's such a. I remember watching that game. I was on my phone in my backyard. I saw a team was like, I got to go inside the house and watch this game. <laughs> it, it's those kind of moments between players of that level of skill 
pushing the metagame forward that much. That That's what makes black-white history so intriguing, like nothing else in competitive Pokemon history, in my opinion. No, there's no other generation that has had the extreme overhauls. Like, even in DPP, we dropped Latias back in, and, you know, Stahl's gotten better over time. And it's, you know, pretty drastic, all things considered, but it's nothing compared to the changes in black and white. So, uh, let's recap. It's 2015, Exedrill comes down, cannot use Sand Rush on a Sand team, but can use Sand Rush outside of Sand. So people weren't really sure how to go about using Excadrill, so they didn't really touch it. The idea behind Excadrill was, there's too many hazards, it makes the Magic Guard Pokemon stupid, let's add a good spinner because Starmie and Fortress are terrible and Donphan is only restricted to Sun, and we want to nuke Sun too because Chlorophyll Doug is stupid, which I agree with. And yeah, we could have yeah, done I more, we could have been a lot more elegant with how we handled it, but, you know, yeah, a lot of the time with tiering, with tiering, you often have to take what you can get, and there's actually a fantastic example of that coming up uh, fairly soon. So 2015, uh, stuff happens, and uh, so extra drill goes down, uh, sun leaves, and Magic Guard slowly but surely, you know, becomes less extreme, less we gotta ban this. Yeah, and it, uh, it definitely took a dip, especially Rio Nicholas. Alakazam was still a good balance kind of cleaner. But mm -hmm. Rio Nicholas, from being top tier, is still good, but not like amazing. Not like we need to ban this thing. So, yeah, no one wanted to ban Rio Nicholas in 2016. No. Anymore. Uh, so then, uh, 2016 rolls around. You're starting an SPL in black and white for the first time, and there were yeah. some really good games that uh, season. And you know, we're starting to gain more of an identity. Teams are actually like decent. They're not. Rain like, is starting to have an identity again, which yeah. is really cool. It had started before, but it kept going. Whereas yeah, before, it was just... Other than a small handful of players who really knew what they were doing, then before you had like haphazardly thrown together teams of stuff. And now you actually had like well-structured teams. So yep. that was really nice to see. And then, uh, let's see, what else? So we didn't really see too much... Like enormous metagame development in SPL 7 that I can recall, other than people still not using Excadrill. So, yeah, Excadrill was a late bloomer. Yeah, very honestly. late. Not for a long time, actually. So, was there for anything else in SPL 7? Years, I think Excadrill didn't really pop up to like SPL 8. No, no, no. We're, no, we'll get to not. Excadrill later. I just mean if there was anything else during SPL 7, like, period. No, it was really, it was really kind of smooth sailing. I think the only that thing like that popped up was actually no, Mian Shao. Mian Shao oh, got. Yeah. Uh, uh, was that more World Cup or was that more SPL? No, that was SPL remember. because I remember okay. Jirachi beat Marth with it, and Evwell fused it against Soulwind, I believe, and it was really good. Yeah. And, and that yeah, prompted yeah, me oh, to I use Mian Shao, and uh, that prompted me to use Mian Shao a lot, and it was just a good Pokemon. It was really hard to handle. Because it just killed everything. Yeah, I mean, and Protect killed ran, Manshaw it, later it on. U-turn, Hidden Power Ice, and I mean, you can pretty much pick the filler. Both honestly. Life Orb and Scarf sets were amazing. And it, yeah, and you know, Scarf was a bit more common, but Life Orb was impossible to counter at that time. Absolutely. Like, you didn't have, like, Jellicent, and Jellicent gets worn down by Spikes plus Pursuit, and it's like, oh crap, now what do I do? Yeah, it was and like one of those Pokemon you can't really... really don't love it either. Yeah, you can't really check it without... Its checks are very exploitable. Unfortunately, two and a half years later, the Protect Influx really killed it, but... Yeah. So, yeah, there was uh, that. And then, after SPL 7, then I have to talk about myself again. Because I was oh, I cool. took I took Jirachi's team, and I changed the Garchomp from Choice Band to Choice Scarf. And every single game I played, you probably remember my Scarf Chomp phase, I was just screaming, oh my god, Scarf Chomp is so good. Scarf Chomp kills everything. Every single game. It was amazing. It yeah. felt like Scarmory every single game. Scarmory was in game. a major lull. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Even when I played Scarmory, like, it was doable. It was manageable with other pokes. Like, HP Fire Zam would lure in the specially defensive sets and deal with them. But I loved Scarf Chomp. It cleaned up the nonsense so well. People were talking about uh, hating Volcarona a lot. And, you know, before post SPL 7, I was kind of disinterested in black and white because I didn't like it. And I was talking to CL and I was like, so what do you think about this Volcarona stuff? And CL said, you know, no one even uses Scarf Chomp, which completely destroys it. Uh, so I don't know why they're complaining. I was like, okay, I'll just use Scarf Chomp. 
and the dual chop break zams magic guard sash. It was it, so practical, yes. Yeah, it's so it was it cleaned up so hard with its wonderful stab combination and power, and it was faster than everything, faster than Scarf Lando. Scarf Lando gets worn down with rocks up. Uh, oh, it, it was absolutely nuts. And uh, so I love Scarf Chomp, and that I think it didn't like warp the metagame. I'm not going to pretend that, but it became a big part of the metagame again, and it shaped. And one of the reasons Scarf Manchow was so good was because it outsped Scarf Garchomp, and Scarf Keldeo came back in a major way as well for similar reasons. So uh, yeah, Scarf Chomp was big, and that was a big development. And I got to say, 2016 Black and White is my favorite post Black and White one metagame. It was. I agree. It was really good. No one was abuse. Only Omfuga was abusing Sandrush Excadrill, and he was <laughs> using it on his Jinx team with no Ferrothorn, so its impact was kind of you know limited, not a huge deal. And oh, uh, uh, so I really. Other than that, there was really nothing. Reuniclus wasn't a problem because people were using a Dark Gem Titar. Do you remember that? Oh yes, dark, because people are less strapped for Chapel Grady when mm -hmm. the Magic Arts strategies kind of slowly, I don't want to say died out, but dropped they did for uses. a while. Like, so it, it made it so that more people were using Dark Gem, which was a huge boost in power and it offered a lot more trapping opportunities, but also um, it honestly just, it made it so the Tar was more of an actual offensive threat as opposed to more of a utility, if that makes sense. It was Choice Band that could switch moves, basically. Yeah, and Choice Band Tyranidar, in my opinion, just hasn't been very good in Black White. It just is that way, because Black into a move like that, it's it's rough, and you lose the defense utility, but... CBTAR during the main level. gen was great, but then but, after, yeah, not modern, so much. Yeah. As the fighting types, the fighting coverage Pokemon rose higher and higher, you have to use Chopple more and more, or at least Scarf, but, you know, in 2016, then you could use CB, you could use Dark Gem, you had some freedom, it was really nice, I loved that metagame, it was, I felt like, uh, I guess it hadn't been figured out as much, but I was ba building a lot of great teams, and they were well equipped to handle the metagame, and for the first time in years, I was enjoying Black and White again, and I think a lot of other people really enjoy that metagame as well. Yes, so, same. And the only thing that really ruined it was the following SPL. Then uh, Jade was on my team, and I was helping him with teams, and most of the time we were using Sand, because for a while I had a philosophy. You gotta use Sand. You use T-Tar every team, because there's no sense losing to Rain, and there's no sense losing to Latios, because you couldn't pursue it. So I just was very no-nonsense, and I would use Sand in literally every game, other than some Smoke and Tor games where I would use CL's Drag Mag, just because I felt like it. And it was pretty good anti-cheese, actually, because anyone looking to sweep with the Volcarona would not get past Kieran Black and Dragonite and Scarf Chomp. So, that was really nice. But there was also the fact that um, Sand was just very no-nonsense, very reliable, and I never was... I was never losing because I brought Sand, you know? I was having a lot of success with it, and it was just reliable and strong overall. And it, it, this was not a new idea because Blue always used to say, the reason I'm so successful in black and white is because I use sand. And everyone can f mess around and use their rain and, you know, get their little polytoad going and try to abuse their water. But the fact is, sand is consistent, sand is reliable, sand is the best overall, and that's why I used it. And I uh, took a leaf out of her book and used that because it was just... It wasn't just that, but the fact that whenever I tried to use another style of team, I would get ripped open by Life Orb Starmie, Latios would run me over, Tentacruel would be unkillable, and I was just like, why? Why would I let Rain just have free Rain? Pun intended. So, uh, I was using Sand. Anyway, to get back to my original point, I say that to say this. Then I was like, well, for the sake of it, let's just at least pretend like we want to use another style than Sand, right? So, I decided, uh, I came up with a team that had Sandrush Excadrill and, um, Scarf Keldeo. So, no matter what weather, then you would have the best clean- You would have the best cleaner in each respective weather. You either have Sand up and you yeah, have Excadrill, or you have Rain up and you have Scarf Keldeo, who's dumb. So, that actually made Rain offense worth using once in a while. And then after that SPL, then the floodgates opened and everyone was like, hey, that combination's really good. Let's use it. 
And we had our, you know, our beloved piece of... We had about a little over a year of a great black and white one metagame, and then it was like, uh-oh, Sandrush is actually busted as hell when used on sa on Rain. And, uh, yeah, so do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I've been yammering. So, Sand Teams, as BKC stated, were rightfully a large portion of the status quo at the time, and it's just a global standard. You, you, you kind of are cheesing to a slight extent when using rain, or especially weatherless at the time, and you get it, because if you use rain and you run into Latios, it's going to be hard, especially if Pharaoh then runs into some nonsense, it gets crippled or overwhelmed or whatever it might be, and weatherless has the whole rain problem, the whole tentacle problem, Starmie, Keldeo, etc. So sand is the default. However, rain teams have a way to circumvent the... I don't want to say the entirety of sand teams, because there are ways for sand teams to beat Exedra. It wasn't like... Uh, oh, you see this and you lose type of thing. It wasn't that extreme. The metagame, in my opinion, was still very playable with Sand Textural in it, but it wasn't ideal because you had all of a sudden you had this Pokemon that had double the speed. So there are two ways to generally counter Pokemon. Revenge killing them, i.e. offensive counterplay, and checking slash countering them defensively in the real sense of the word. Defensive counterplay. Now, Exedrill with Swords Dance, it is meant to break through normal defensive counterplay. A plus two Iron Head can two kill Gliscor with one flinch and can win the 1v1 easily. And not to mention that Skarmory, especially if it's not running Rocky Helmet, can actually get worn down by a boosted Iron Head from Extra as well. Ferrothorn, and, and Slowbro... The, I, I wanted to uh, mention the, sorry, real quick, the main problem of Excadrill is that how it reset any pressure that you could apply to the rain team. Because if you have oh, a sand true. team, you can realistically prevent Starmie or Tentacruel from ruining your day because they're not great against Ferrothorn, especially if you're good about keeping up your sand. Whereas Excadrill not only doesn't care about that, but actually punishes you for winning the Weather War. It's a, it was a Pokemon so busted you weren't even allowed to use it yourself, and then you had to deal with it on the opposing team, and it was insanely oppressive because you cannot outspeed uh, an Excadrill in Sand. So you are forced into defensive counters, and those defensive yeah. counters give up their rocks, which are so valuable, because as soon as you lose your hazards, you are losing pressure on Thunderous, Tornadus, Latios, Keldeo, everything. You think Stealth Rock's not a big deal against Keldeo? Well, tell me about it after Keldeo has come in 16 times without being punished for its switch-ins and has blasted you with Specs Hydro Pump over and over. You want rocks up against Keldeo. You want sand yeah. up to chip the Keldeo, but with extra drill, then you can. It was unbelievably stupid. Sorry, keep going. Yeah, just one point. So basically, what happened was extra had freed up its ability to kind of negate defensive counterplay, or at least minimize it, as BKC said, and therefore it was able to function not only in that regard to clear the field and make everything I've seen better, but also offensively, especially in late games, it was able to outrun things like Alakazam, Latios. Etc. that you found on these sand teams and function as this pseudo revenge killer slash cleaner. And this combined with the fact that it was an awesome utility, it was just like all of a sudden the tables have turned. Now rain teams are putting the status quo of sand teams on an inherent disadvantage. And now you might ask, oh, but wait, Finch, isn't it okay that the status quo changed as long as nothing's broken? But think about this effect Extra's having. It's not only a massive supporter, but now all of a sudden it's one of the best wind conditions slash cleaners. It's faster than everything. And then you realize that giving something twice as much speed, eliminating offensive counterplay, forcing defensive things to not get their, you know, status, their hazards, etc., up to cripple things, it just has this trickle-down effect that's ridiculous. And that's what I'm trying to say, that inviting a defensive counterplay is one thing, but all the tools actual has it, basically invalidating progress making in a tier where every single turn means so damn much to every single game. It makes it so that extra drills impact with sand rush on rain teams was just ridiculously oppressive. So then, um, was this, was Extra Drill, was, was Sand Rush the next ban we had? I can't quite remember the sequence. I think, yeah, it, it had to be. And we fought for like a year to get rid of it. And Oh, there were so many back and forth discussions. What do we do? Why do we do it? How do we justify it? Do people believe hearing old gen tears is acceptable anymore? There were like multiple PR threads. Our council chat had thousands of messages. It was like me and BKC talking, and EO wasn't always on our side, but he at least was being reasonable, then eventually we got Dice on our side, it was just like, it, it almost became political, and I don't love that. It, me it was a mess and a half, yeah. and, oh man, 
I don't remember when exactly we managed to ban it because I remember I was still running anti Sandrush drill tactics in SPL 9, so 2018, and it was. I remember in uh, early summer 2017, there was a thread made look, guys, this, this has got to go. And then you had the people. Then you had the people uh, going, oh, it's not that bad, you know, adapt. That's a favorite of people who like to argue against something getting banned. They can always just say, they can always just say you need to adapt and never tell you how. And so I really hate arguing that sort of stuff. But yeah, uh, Drill was dumb. Drill was really, really dumb with Sandrush and uh, it was almost comical. It was comical how absolutely dumb it was because what are you going to do? Lose the weather war against rain? You know, why are you running sand in the first place? So, uh, rain it was... Just, it made us think how the whole tier functioned. Yeah, because in the entire point of sand, other than Titar is a good Pokemon that handles Latios, very much of it is uh, based on stuffing rain, because we've already talked about how dumb Tentacruel is unchecked and Keldeo and Starmie and whatnot. Yeah. So... And then there's this whole philosophical debate that I'm going to briefly touch on. I don't want to get too far into it, but... Uh, actually, feel it? free to, because I actually have to... Uh, I'll be back in two minutes, so all you... Okay, guys. So, Excadrill is clearly the pro problem with Sandrush on rain teams. We can identify that. We can pinpoint that. But how do you deal with that? Do you, A, ban Excadrill as a Pokemon, but then you lose Excadrill, which overall is a great Pokemon in the metagame, contributes a lot. And much like in the past... We've seen things like Garchomp Band that eventually came back because, you know, they have other abilities or other things at their disposal, and we could find an element of it that is broken universally and kind of universally, and one of those things was Sand Veil. But now you're like, wait, is Sand Rush broken? Is Sand Rush the issue? And unfortunately, you can't really say things like Statlin are broken, but then you look at the bigger picture here, and you see we've already had issues with Swift Swim. We've already had issues with Chlorophyll. Maybe, just maybe, the fact of the matter is that the problem is these weather speed boosting abilities, making it so that that offensive counterplay that I alluded to before, it just isn't there anymore. If you can't revenge kill something in a tier such so fast paced like black white, it's gonna sweep a lot of teams, it's gonna win games, and there's no real getting around it, and that just wasn't a competitive dynamic when it's given the Pokemon that are so offensively potent, like Kingdra and Rain, or Venusaur and Sun, or in this case extra drill in sand when used on rain teams. And I know that when used on rain teams it's an extra condition, but Seeing how common both rain and sand are, seeing how mainstream it is, it really doesn't matter. So ultimately, this led to a piece of tiering that I like to call the deconstruction of Eldritch's proposal and the reconstruction of like parallel structure and tiering, if you will. I know it's a mouthful, but think about it. So if we're able to deconstruct a proposal, just ban Swift Swim, ban Chlorophyll, and ban Sand Rush, all of a sudden, all these problems are solved. We don't have a million unnecessary complex bans. Excadrill is usable, but not in the broken past. We don't have other complex bands applies, and overall, it's just a step in the right direction. So, after months and months and months of BKC, me, eventually Dyson, EO, just tirelessly fighting for this, arguing for it, making PR threads, having votes, which one of them was infamously like out by like one vote that was submitted like 10 minutes later, so I don't remember the details of it, but it was not pretty. Eventually, it went through, and Almost every black-white player, it's accepted as a great decision. In the eyes of the outside community, some people are like, oh my god, this really happened, this is a bit much. But you know what? It's been great, and I'm overly enthusiastic about it. And um, Anything to add, Kevin? I think Kevin's still doing things. So let me just elaborate a bit more in the process that we applied here. A big thing was that we had to find a certain group of players to have each vote without like just picking names at random because... That's a bit arbitrary and gives a lot of power to the Black White Tiering Council. So we used tournament results. So we were having, instead of, you know, a suspect test, it's not a main generation, we were having people who played the tier in SPL, World Cup, etc., vote on it and post in the thread. And the thing is that not everyone who played the tier had um, had a very up-to-date view on it, especially because the metagame kept changing at such a rapid pace. So in a normal suspect test, you have people voting on the current metagame, people that just got racks in that metagame. But in this case, you're going back a year. And the thing is, that again, this this process, Sandrush Extra was a late bloomer. It took a while to develop, and because of this, it caused some controversy, some hesitance. And I'm just looking at the the policy review threads on Smogin right now, which if you want to know more, just check it out. And I mean, it was such a drawn out process, but eventually we got it through. 
Um, unfortunately, though, there were still some molehills, if you will, that we had to deal with. But it was a huge step in the right direction for Black White Tearing. It was something that I considered to be a win and something that, I mean, BKC and I just ruthlessly pushed for. Um, beyond great timing, that, great timing, timing because I literally just came back from picking up my dinner okay, at nine thirty. So I heard well, most I of what you said. And, uh, I, I agree with it. So one second. Okay. Yeah. So we were just touching on how we basically fought ruthlessly for the sand rush slash chlorophyll slash whipson ban instead of banning Exedrill or employing some dumbass nonsensical complex ban again. Yeah. And it kind of righted the wrongs of the path and also just made black-white a better tier than it was, if you will. Yeah, of course. And there were always people going, oh, the council is biased and wants to ban this. And <coughs> the player list isn't perfect. Yeah, okay. Well, we are very much dealing with an imperfect system because of the imperfect decisions of our predecessors so we are trying to fix what we can and that's not easy because you know the metagame was there's so much precedent you gotta argue and then you gotta argue with people who don't care and are, are just trying to make your life difficult and going is sandrush extra really that bad just use a skarmory and just completely missing the point and nonsense like that so yeah it's a lot of bad faith arguments, and I've had enough of those for a lifetime. So you gotta yeah, I hate the devil's advocate players who uh, don't actually care about the tier or play the tier, but just post to try and nitpick your logic, and it's just it's, it's not a it's not push. I uh, didn't care for those. Yeah. Uh, so what else was there? So yeah, extra drill. We finally eventually got Sandrush canned, and that was good. And then there was another issue. In, well, uh, actually, wait, can I just correct us for a second here? Please do. Um, we actually touched on Doug Trio yes, before that's it. we did Action Drill in April of 2018. Yes. Which, unfortunately, was before the action. It, it should have been after, but because of all the politics. But Doug Trio was a bit more of a universally like acceptable decision. Exactly. Although yeah. there, were, there were a couple closet nitpickers, and the thread had a couple pages of discussion. Ultimately, we, we were able to vote to ban it, and that ban went through. Um, it was actually strongly in favor, too. This was like an overwhelming ban, and with that ban, Arena Trap and Shadow Attack were done. Which well, were actually, two actually, I wanted to mention something in that we had to take what we could get because people wanted to ban Doug Trio, and that was fine, and then we wanted to extend it to Arena Trap, and everyone was like... And then there were like some people who don't play the tier going... Wait, why Arena Trap? Why not just Doug Trio? Are you sure Diglett and Trappinger are going to be broken? And then, lo and behold, we had to say, okay, fine. It's either Doug Trio or nothing, and we got to take what we can get. And so, fine, we will take the Doug Trio thing. And uh, then, of course, people were still spamming Diglett, Cheese, and... And yes, it actually is broken when it traps T-Tar and Heatran, you know, big pillars of the metagame. It's hard enough to check everything going on without this nonsense. So then we had to extend it to Arena Trap, and that was a whole thing. And we got rid of Shadow Tag in one fell sweep, swoop. So, yeah. good riddance and there. One thing I want to note is that we actually had to pair Exedrill with Diglett, if you recall. S wait, sorry, say it once again? We had... Because we banned Doug Trio and not Arena Trap, if you might recall. Sure. We had to pair. I, I'm looking at the PR thread right now, and the title of the thread is B White, Black and White OU, Diglett, and Excadrill Suspect Discussion. <laughs> and I'm just remembering now, we had to have a separate test on Diglett specifically. Oh. Which just shows yeah. you to jump through. I remember this was like the most annoying little bit of it. And we eventually did push through the Excadrill, as I mentioned, but. Also, people voted to ban Diglett, and then I think eventually we changed it to, to Arena Trap. I, I can't quite remember, honestly. Hmm, I think so. And at that point, no one was going to fight to save Trap Inch if Diglett was already gone. I don't remember. Yeah, I just remember. I think eventually, it's just like we draw the line. But regardless, that whole concept of trapping is now gone besides Magnazone in Pursuit, thankfully. Yeah, uh, those are the non-extremely broken ones. We need those to keep the metagame in check as opposed to... You know, having the more extreme elements of the metagame made even more difficult to deal with. 
So yeah, uh, yeah, that was infuriating dealing with that and extra drill. And then you know once those were gone, I think that was everything. And unless I'm missing something, I think that covered it all. But uh, yeah, we are now. Well, technically speaking, we could have left off in 2018. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, sleep, sleep. We did. Oh yeah, yeah. We'll get to that. So yeah, we get rid of X Rush Excadrill permanently, not just outside of sand. Thank God. And we get rid of stupid arena trap and removing the few sources of stuff that's really overwhelming. And Shadow Tag gets banned in like very early 20, in 2019, I believe. Yeah, yeah, something like that. And uh, you know, people were people always. There's a thing throughout Black and White which I think is fundamentally anti-competitive. You know, people who use a lot of strong sand teams, then people will go, "Oh, you just want to, you just want safe wins with your, with your standard sand," and that just, and you know, anything that threatens that needs to get banned. And I feel like uh, I want to clear up why that kind of mindset is not competitive or competitively minded or whatever way you want to describe that. So when I use sand then I am not using sand because I want a free win. I am using sand because it lets me not automatically lose to the biggest threats in the metagame. Black and exactly. white Black and white has a balance to it, but that's because you need to use Pokemon that handle the huge hitters out there. And if you don't do that, you are going to get mercilessly overrun. There's you can't just say, oh well get creative or adapt. You know, because that doesn't that doesn't mean anything. You can say that to everything. You could say Genesect wasn't broken. You just had to adapt to it. Nonsense. So when I use sand, I am not using sand because I want free wins. Because look, if your team can't beat standard sand, then it's a bad team. So I'm using standard sand or whatever you think is standard sand. I don't think it's standard. Not important. You know, semantics. Uh, standard is often used as a pejorative term, and I really dislike that. But I'm using, it, I'm using it because it lets me actually handle the threats in the metagame. I like not automatically losing to Rain, Tentacruel, and Keldeo. I like actually being able to take Latios out after it takes out one Pokemon as opposed to having it run circles around me the whole time. You know, I like actually being able to deal with the big threats in the metagame. And that is important because that provides stability in what would otherwise be a very chaotic metagame. You know, yeah, it's not perfect if you have to use sand to hold the metagame together against Latios and Rain. That's not a very good. And I agree, we shouldn't have to, but that's the card we've been dealt, or the hand we've been dealt, rather. And at this point, realistically, we would never remove Rain and or Latios or even Keldeo. So you, we mm -hmm. kind of have to make the best of a bad situation. You need some stability in the metagame unless you think that just chaos is preferable. <laughs> So yeah, I like using sand because that's why I was consistent. That's why blue was consistent. That's why most black and white players are consistent. They use a lot of sand. You're not going to see. A I'm consistent. Same with Soul Wind too. Yeah. He maybe has a bit more deviation than most, but still, we both default to sand. Sand is at least fifty percent. Sand of our is use. stability in a meta game where stability can be hard to come by. So I'm not saying, look, if I wanted to ban everything that annoys Sand, you know what I would ban? I would ban Hydreigon. I would ban Garchomp. Those guys are the worst. I can't, Sand teams hate those. Sand teams hate Gliscor. Sand teams hate a lot of stuff, but it's not, lol, it beats a Sand team, we gotta ban it. That's just a very, that is a willfully ignorant misrepresentation of the sentiment behind those things being banned. Because if something is threatening the stability of the metagame, yeah, you can adapt, but when there aren't very many options and, you know, the whole matchup thing, yes, matchup will always exist in Pokemon. It, the, uh, matchup becomes a problem when you really are not able to realistically handle the different styles in the metagame without doing a true pick your poison. You know, before Sandrush Excadrill, you could handle the metagame, or before people were actually abusing Sandrush Excadrill, the metagame was very manageable by a very diverse style, a very diverse set of teams. You know, people look at Sand and go, lol, Sand, boring. You know how much there di how much diversity there is in Sand teams? See, people don't see the big picture a lot of the time, they're just like, 
And they just go, well, you know, sand, boring, standard, you want free wins. And it's like, nope, that's not it. So I just wanted to clear that up because being anti-standard and you know, anti-using good Pokemon is perplexing and it's uh, very much... It, that, we, tr we try to make a metagame where y the better player wins and we do not want elements where you can just pop in you know, Sun or Rush Excadrill and just beat someone just because they cannot cover them, A, because the options to do so are minimal, or B, because doing so would make them irrevocably vulnerable to another top tier threat. You know, you can't say, oh, that's your fault for using Tyranitar. Yeah, Tyranitar, that one Pokemon that prevents you from losing to more than half the metagame. So, uh... Yeah, it's like the, so we have seen that sentiment all throughout the generations. Like when people go, "Oh, we don't need to ban Sandvale. That's the ru that's the risk you run for running sand." So I've uh, silly because you can't justify punishing something by including something uncompetitive because mm. then all of a sudden the whole meta game is just gonna unravel in front of our eyes. Yeah, yeah, it, and yeah, broken text broken is part of what black and white is, like it or not. But that that argument itself is just completely filled with spud. Instead of actually competitive and sorry, you, uh, and that's when I start to you know, have an issue with these people who are chirping their, their songs. You cut out a little bit there, but the general sentiment came across. So speaking yeah, okay. of um, sorry. speaking of anti-competitive stuff, then uh, so now we have a pretty good metagame now that we've banned sleep. So do you want to take the reins on why sleep was dumb and anti-competitive and why everyone was very glad to give it a ban? So, sleep this generation, for those of you who don't know, doesn't reset upon switching out. My voice good enough? Okay, good. So, let's say on turn one, I use four with my Berloom on an Amulius. And by the way, you can sleep craft sets this generation as well. So, therefore, it's a sleep. And let's say I stay in turn two as they go to their, I don't know, their heat trend. Sure. Now, heat trend threatens me out, so I gotta switch out. So all of a sudden, I've not woke it up, and I take it to a sleep turn. So if I come back up, I'm going to wake up, right? No, you, you sleep turn reset to zero. So all of a sudden, you're basically down a Pokemon. Because of this, players adapted to sleep by running things like Sleep Talk on Specs Latios and Amoongus in the fourth slot, even so Chip Bloom, and even things like Choice Band Dragonetic here in black as well in the fourth slot. And, you know, this did make it so that sleep was semi-manageable. I will say that, but it also produced this whole thing of Sleep Talk Roulette, where if your Choice Grab Landorus T or your Latios with Specs picks the right moves on, like, repeatedly, like, it's, it's suddenly going to, like, just make it, like, a complete sheer guessing game around that, which is stupid in and of itself. But then you couple that with the fact that you're basically forcing a Pokemon to be used as Sleep Otter on every team, and it's like, oh, my God, why is this so disruptive? Why is this so restrictive? And then you couple with the fact that Amoongus and Berloom, two of the premier Pokemon meta game, are abusers of this, and it's like, wow, I have to go so far out of my way to combat this, maybe this is the problem. Maybe sleep, when turns don't reset upon switching out, actually is fundamentally uncompetitive and broken in the metagame, and, well, we actually had a vote on it, and it was basically unanimous, I believe. It was very close to it. So it turns out that all along, something that, okay, it took years to develop. It took years for sleep on Berloom and Amoongus to become mainstream. And it took years for people to react to that. And it took years for us to kind of notice the, like, semblance of that reaction, because keep in mind, this is a metagame that's very old, so things do take time. Developments are kind of incremental, but finally we're like, wow, okay, this needs to be banned, and we worked on it, and we got it done right before SPL this year, and now sleep is long gone, and I am very appreciative of that fact. I think the metagame we have now is my third favorite black and white of all time. I'd say it's up there. It's either yeah. the third or fourth for me. Mm. Yeah, so you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, Latios is too good now, now that it doesn't have to run sleep talk, so... Now Latios is broken, and before it wasn't because it had to run Sleep Talk. What is your rebuttal to that? My rebuttal to that is that, A, Latios, in my opinion, is broken, but if we were to ban it, then a lot of other things would be broken, and it would deface the whole metagame, and at some point you do have to draw a line, and I agree it's arbitrary, but I think that we would be opening a can of worms that would never close again, and... I don't think anyone wants to do that once they view the whole risk versus reward of the situation. And but I also, think, I also think, wait, if I just don't, add one more thing, I don't think that 
sleep talk or not is the difference between Latios being broken or not. That's so what I wanted to say. Really if Latios is broken <laughs> without sleep talk, or yeah. then it's if probably it's broken. broken now, it's broken or two, or the difference is so marginal that you would vote ban regardless, in my opinion. And yeah. therefore, why weren't you proposing this before when we were making more active changes? Yeah. And the fact that it matters, you weren't before because you realize this can of worms, and now you're just trying to nitpick and open another can of worms when realistically, black white has reached a point of stability. Yeah, it's a. I mean, right now it's a good balance between yeah, you got to run the stuff that handles the meta game like you always have, but at least now it's it's manageable again, and you're not constantly do, like. Remember that game where uh, Ojama couldn't handle We Three Kings as Landorus because every oh time. God, every single time. It That's kept, like sleep, the it kept sleep talking the right move, and you can't predict yeah. that. So, uh, it, it was a positive to remove that from the tier. Yeah, it, the sleep talk rule that is what I call it. And it's stupid, <laughs> it's arbitrary, it's guessing work, and there's nothing you can do against it. And if it ends up getting the right move every single time, then you've turned a game which you should have lost into a game you should have won based on sheer luck. And I get it, there are luck elements in the game, you can't avoid that, but... When sleep itself is already completely busted in my eyes, it's just one of many other reasons to put on the top of the pile for why we should have banned it. Yeah, I agree entirely. It was... Uh, and we did. Yeah, thank God. I and mean, for the record, it was a vote. It was not just like an outright ban. We got a very yeah, strong majority yeah. with this ban. Yeah, nobody except like two people wanted it to stay. So, Latios, I mean, it is a dumb, broken Pokemon, but it's... It's necessary to the balance, I would say. If there was one Pokemon I could remove from Black and White, it would be Keldeo, and here's why. Uh, building teams is restrictive enough as is, and building against Rain is already pretty restrictive. But, in Black and White 1, Rain wasn't even that good, and this was because you could run a variety of two water resists on your sand teams, and that made it a lot easier to deal with. And... Uh, let's say, for example, Ferrothorn and Rotom Wash. They cannot. Mm -hmm. They uh, are going to destroy most Sand teams. And they are obviously completely helpless against Keldeo. So when you add has to be good against Keldeo to the list of requirements for your teams, then that makes it much, much, much harder to build. And, you know, Keldeo is also insanely busted on its own because it's fast. It's strong. It has a very small list of counters. Again, the restrictive factor. And it can, of course, breeze pot by those counters with little support. Because either you have Pursuit on, uh, on Sand, or you have the sheer power of Rain, which makes Hydro Pump just stupid. And it's too fast, it's too strong, it's too easy to support. And, it and most of all, it really restricts the teams you are able to build. And thus, I would... I think black and white without Keldeo would be very good. But I recognize that most people are not going to feel about this as strongly as I am. And, you know, I would not mind a metagame with no Latios and no Keldeo. But if I just had to pick one, I'd definitely pick Keldeo. Because Keldeo, yeah. that, that will open up a lot of possibilities in team building. So. Yeah, I'm with you. If I had to ban one single Pokemon, it would either be Politoed or Keldeo. Politoed because Rain. Keldeo because of the reasons you stated, but personally, I think I'm fine just leaving the metagame alone as is. Yeah, me too. Um, there's, like you could say, Politoed. I mean, I would like a metagame of just Sand and Weatherless, pretty much, because Sun is completely dead now, as it should be. Stupid cheese with Dugtrio is nonsense. You know, the yeah. Cresselian, ugh, gross. But, um... You know, just Sand and Weatherless, that would be a great metagame to me. I think Sand on Sand games are great. I think Sand on Weatherless games are great. There's a lot less reason to run T-Tar if you can run Weatherless. Uh, because stuff like Jirachi is a great check to Latios as long as it's not also, you know, rain-boosted Surf so it gets another stab. So... Yep. <laughs> and, uh, and you can run Weatherless a lot more easily when you're not getting ripped apart by, you know, unkillable Tentacruel or Life Orb Starmie or... Uh, Keldeo, of course, so I would like that, but I recognize it's not realistic as it uproots the identity of the generation yeah. and while that's not a competitive minded move, I get it you know, I, you know, it's not unreasonable, so whereas Keldeo, I think, there would not be a big um, 
there would not be as big a domino effect. I don't think you can remove Latios without removing Keldeo because Latios is the best de facto Keld check. And Latios really sucks. It's so, so, so weak. Titar just completely obliterates it. And you know, it's, Latios doesn't threaten nearly as much in return, you know. Part of the reason Latios is so good, it threatens Keldeo with more offense, and Latios can't hope to replicate that. The extra bulk does nothing, functionally. So I don't think you could have no Latios and no Keldeo, but I do think that since Black and White has found a way to deal with Latios in its own way, then you could have Keldeo and no Latios. Or, sorry, no, no Keldeo and you could have Latios. Yeah, that's what you meant, yeah. Yeah, yeah Latios, you're going to have your teams warped in the same way because of rain, but Keldeo opens up more options for dealing with rain, rather than, okay, now one of my water resists has to also resist fighting, so I have to pick from this very low, a uh, very small list. So, very small Mainly list of Pokemon cool. that aren't even all that good, because Amoongus with the sleep ban blows. Yep. Yeah, so... It really does. We're, it's awful. It really is horrendous. So we're there are like three or four teams I have with it, and those teams all absolutely fold if you can't get a burn with Rotom Watch or a trick from Radios onto Ferrothorn in the first couple of turns. Because mm -hmm. Ferrothorn just sits there at this point, especially on rain teams. It gets some this. If you can't sleep it, it sucks. Oh, that's another thing. If trick is so broken on Latios, you just run another Sleep Talk user, and uh, then you run yeah. trick on it and make it broken anyway. Like. Uh, you can run Sleep Talk Amoongus. You know, I had a lot of teams. I would run Sleep Talk Amoongus, and I was like, oh, sweet. I can run Trick on my Latios now. And because Sleep Talk Amoongus was good. Or uh, I could run Poison Heal Gliscor as a pseudo check. And, uh, you know, that's not always reliable, because if Amoongus has HP Ice, then good night. But, you know, on teams with, like, Amoongus and Gliscor, then yeah, run Trick Latios. And, you know, that wasn't making it any more broken than it already was. So, uh, we're nearing the end here, but I have a couple more topics, uh, two or sure. three, small ones. So, first one, even post-sleep ban, Breloom is amazing. Matter of fact, it seems like it's better than ever. Yes. So, people actually have been, like, innovating Breloom. Dice, for example, using a sub-punch set. We've seen different sets with Facade. I um, use a Sword Dance Facade set, and then eventually people started using that with Bulk Up, too, or just, like... Also, I think you've mentioned sets with like Toxic and I think Stun Spore that have been seen a bit more sporadically, but it's still viable. I haven't and seen Stun Spore, with, but I actually saw you using Toxic, so... Yeah, I thought that was your idea from IRL or P maybe someone else brought it up in our chat. I, no, I remember it, and didn't someone not bring it like right around the time SPL ended? I remember seeing it. I did not have the idea of Toxic. Okay, well, really. someone someone came up with that idea, and whoever that someone is deserves credit, but yeah. basically... Maybe it was like Katana or something. Maybe, but within the whole realm of the uh, Poison Heal sets... There's a lot of, you know, versatility and threatening stuff right now. I mean, I played Twixtry for Black and White Seasonal Finals Round 1, and his sub punch for Loom just picked off, like, three kills every time I fired out on him. It was just, like, a nightmare. You got to be prepared for that stuff right now. Take and then it. Choice Band with Technician is really good, too, but it is not, like, immune to Rotom Wash Wisp as much. You got to be careful switching it in, but... That aside, it's still very threatening. Yeah, so, Breloom has some amazing traits because it's, um... It doesn't mind Scald or Rotom Burn, which are very similar. So that's a big, and it completely dominates Ferrothorn. Doesn't care about Leech Seed, doesn't care about Knockoff. So it has a ton of opportunity on a game-to-game -game basis. And Latios gets worn down over time, its checks get worn down over time. And the Sub-Punch set of Dices runs Sub-Punch uh, and Protect, which wasn't seen before. So you get to keep the utility of Protect while also being able to sub up and throw out Focus Punches. So Breloom's really nasty. Yep. And uh, speaking of knockoff, that actually brings me to something I should have mentioned earlier. So at the very beginning, we were talking about how Ferrothorn changed everything. And a couple of years ago, I actually credit Sweepage with the first guy to use knockoff on Ferrothorn. And, you know, slowly people are realizing, oh my god, nothing handles Ferrothorn on rain besides Ferrothorn. So it, the metagame has evolved to a point where every Ferrothorn has knockoff, bar like teams with Ferrothorn and Magnezone, which are extremely rare. And so... 99% of Ferrothorns are running knockoff with the intention of switching into other Ferrothorn and using knockoff on each other and essentially, you know, killing themselves or crippling themselves rather. Yeah. Just because there is no other option to switch into Ferrothorn. Switching into Leech Protect is a nightmare and knockoff is just a great move in general because even if they have a Reuniclus, you knock that off and no, it's Ferrothorn is just such a pain and now all of them run knockoff. Every rain team. Ferrothorn Wars early game, knock each other off, get up a bunch of hazards, and go from there. So that's another big development that we've had. And 
finally, actually, you know, uh, two more. So one, what do you think, what would you say to the people who want to test chlorophyll or now that there is no Doug Trio and no sleep move? So Venusaur can't even sleep stuff. My response is, I'm not going to fight against you if you want to do it because it might very well be okay. But I also think that on the off chance that Venusaur and Sun abuses its coverage to the fullest visibility, it's still going to be really stupid and it might just not be a um, road worth traveling on. It might just not be something worth pursuing because I think there's a genuine chance that it's still ridiculous. People are going to start w noticing that, oh, wow, I could run full coverage moves. Keep in mind, you know, Hidden Powers, their strongest generation, uh, Giga Drain. You know, Sludge Bomb, even Earthquake like Free Train, because you run Mix, Growth gives you two plus two attack as well. And it's just like, you know, what actually counters this thing? And I mean, I'm running out of answers. Can you guys inform me of the answers? If so, then sure. But if not, then I just don't think I'd personally do it. But at least I understand where people are coming from when they say they would do it. Yeah, I do too. And the fact that it can't sleep. Well, Venusaur's most dangerous threat was uh, set was always Growth, Giga, Sludge Bomb, Weather Ball. Not Weather Ball, sorry, HP Fire. Hidden uh, Power, yeah. Um,. Yeah, so it doesn't even need sleep, but of course that set was predicated on the partnership with Dugtrio to remove Heatran. So, I mean, and I also, guess... People, people did fear sleep, so at least they had to be hesitant around it, to be fair. Yeah, that too. Uh, but, I don't know, I just don't like the idea of opening up another cheese avenue, like, whoops, my Venusaur has Earthquake and your specific team can't handle this specific Venusaur set, so I cheese my way to a win. I'm not at all a fan of that. I feel um, like it would just make the tier of guess again. And yeah, I, I, don't, I don't love that. I don't no. think it would be a good addition at all. So, yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't hate it per se, I guess, but I, I don't think it's a worthwhile it. addition. <laughs> I just don't think we should have the speed boosting abilities in any weather. No Swift Swim, no Sand Rush, yeah, no Chlorophyll. I think we should just have all four banned from a tier like Black White, which is so offensive. Yeah. All right, so final little segment. What are some of your favorite memories of the past ten years of Black and White? Let's say around three-ish. Although, if you wanna, if you want to say more, then I'm certainly not gonna stop you. Okay. Coming in at number three will be one that BKC and I sort of shared. Mm -hmm. The World Cup Pokemon 2018. I was on the winning team alongside BKC. I went four and two, although one of my losses was against like a substance. It was a throw again. And playoff <laughs> theory, punch every use. It doesn't matter. I did well. That's the point. I'm not trying to, you know, flex. But that was. I think that I was your. Uh, that was your real breakout tournament. Yeah. Well, yes and no. We'll get to that though. I went four two, and I used a, a nice offensive range, and then I used this really nice Gliscor Sand team in the finals that we made together. Basically, oh, that was and beautiful. And one in the finals against Lack is a great player, and that was great, but. I've had so many memories that just winning a tournament like that sets comes in at number three. At number two um, would be SPL7, which in my opinion was my breakout turn Black White. I went 6 2 in Black White, mm -hmm. and I kind of gained my footing in team building because before that I actually wasn't a super standard player, but I finally got the hang of building sand and rain kind of balance both the offensive teams, and I really got going. And by the end of the tour, we were out early, so I actually used some creative stuff. Like, eh, there's a week I use like a Durant and some crap like that. But <laughs> and Infernape in and Rotom Cut, like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that too. But in the first like five or six weeks of the tour, I really was doing well. I won like four or five of those games, and it was really fun. And it just it felt like I finally got the tier. But all those memories, all these tournaments, and I played so many of them, <laughs> almost too many to really admit without like laughing at myself or just investing that much time into it. But hey, it's a game we love. We're passionate about it. But never, you know, never be ashamed just, for how much. Uh, how never much be you ashamed play. for having a passion, you guys. Yeah. Exactly. But the number one has to be laddering in late black and white one on Pokemon Online on the alt IMP Finchinator. <laughs> I mean, filled with rage and joy and so many other emotions. I was just grinding it out with this nasty rain and standard sand. I had like a scarf heat train and a lore landerous scarf on tran had, had its like time a, a quiver dance volcarona with the rest of the it did it i had all these like random texts i just it was so i was like 14 years old it was so fun it was uh, my first it's what got me hooked in this game I, and you, you I can't replace you those memories so hell yeah to that uh, i remember uh, being young and having all the time in the universe and yeah so i'll just do my my own three i'm not so Please sure do. Uh, I don't even know how to rank them, so I'm just going to list three and any. 
<laughs> so first off, I'm gonna steal the black and white one laddering for you. I'm not gonna measure down to any one specific time, but I am gonna say a mixture of getting number one for the first time with my rain team. I love that. That was the first time I had been number one on an OU ladder, and it was the current gen OU ladder, and I, that was a great feeling. Roscoe called me the king of the server, because the number one player is the king of the server uh, back on PO, and <laughs> that was a great feeling. And then you just black and white one laddering in general. I loved the metagame. I, I didn't really admit it because it had so many flaws still, but it was... It was a. Uh, it was great. It really. I made a ton of teams that were really good, and uh, they were. They worked. They were fun. I was messing around with stuff like Wishments and Defensive Verizion, and you know I still had the tournament stuff like the Hippowdon Scarfragi. Impact in the metagame felt really good. Felt like uh, that was where I was breaking out, and just whenever a team worked out, that was happening a lot back then. So. Black and white one laddering for sure, because uh, when I was making the team with Funkasaurus and then we both got to like number five and number six at the same time, stuff like that. So that's one black and black and white one laddering from let's say Feb January through uh, January 2012 through like May June 2012, which is a pretty long period. Uh, mm -hmm. Then number two is the finals game against Adam slash Yusuke in uh, World Cup 2013 because that game was the one that uh, won me my first trophy and that one felt really good. I was using Sun for that unexpectedly because the previous I guess I could just say World Cup mm -hmm. 2013 as a whole. Because the previous round of the semis, I won with my Sandstall team, and then in the finals, then I brought Sun to you know win us the entire tournament. And that was my first trophy, and that felt really great. And uh, so that's number two. And let's see, what would number three be? Or number one? Um, I don't know. <sighs> It, there's so much to choose because as much as I've ripped on black and white one uh, black and white as a whole in the past for all its flaws it's it has years, been man. It's totally never. it has been a good meta game all in all I mean no I'm not gonna pretend like it didn't have a million flaws for oh, a lot it's of time been messed up. It's been good but I feel like the tournament experiences I had throughout the generation have been yeah I mean I guess I can just uh, narrow it down to or not narrow it down. Leave it to a bunch of different time periods of time, like uh, fall 2012. Somehow, like in Smogan Tour, with my trusty Spadef Hippowdon and Spadef Skarm standing up against the Tornadus T Genesect late in metagame, finding a way. Uh, that, that I really I valued that a lot. And uh, God, I don't know, man. That was. I would say that or the 2016 metagame I really enjoyed. I had a lot of really great games, uh, like the game against Ray in uh, round one of World Cup, the game against Anti to put East in uh, the playoffs. I really like that one, the one with the unexpected Dragon Tail Slow King. You know, just building teams that worked, building a lot of standard sand, <laughs> standard sand, and I Nothing guess wrong with that. yeah, there would I guess there that's a. Uh, that would be probably where I would call it. Um, yeah, I don't think I can really name much more than that because otherwise we really would be here all day. So <laughs> we you, could be, trust me. <laughs> oh, man, part two coming next week. Kidding. So, um, do you have anything you would want to add? Like any final um, words no, about? Thank you so much for having me, guys. Um, BKT is some amazing old generation content, and I love being able to really provide with that, help you guys with that. Because let me tell you guys, this meta game is something I basically grew up on. Like there are some pastimes we all have, like be it a sport or you know another game. Me, black and white OU is like a large part of that, like that picture for me, and it's an amazing ten years. And I'm here to hoping for many more good years of black white. Yeah, no. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's in a good place right now. I think uh, yes. there's enough room for... Uh, it's funny because black and white, in a way, is the metagame I, that I think has the least room for 
true innovation. And I don't mean that you can't use like unexpected stuff or like creative stuff, but I mean that it's a lot harsher to deviating from the norm than a lot of metagames. Like for example, advance, you can uh, be very versatile and bring a lot of wacky stuff. Whereas in black and white, then you don't really get to do that. There's a very high threshold of you know, what is viable, so you can't just nonsense your way through it with random Pokemon. But, uh, so, you know, would you agree with that? 100% all heartedly, yes. Yeah, so, I don't know, I think we'll see some more cool stuff, but it's more going to be variations on, variations on what we already know, which, you know, I'm okay with personally. I like stable Nothing metagames. I like seeing cyclical metagames. I feel like ADV is a great place, for example, and I'd love to see... Black and white, maybe not necessarily evolve in a similar fashion, but in its own spin on that sort of. Thing. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, the want. players constantly playing it and seeing what can be done in the metagame. You're not going to be seeing like revolutionary stuff every other game, but you are going to see like the little things, like the uh, like good application of gems, or you know, bringing back Scizor, who's fallen off, or. Uh, I don't know, ma making underrated u use of the underrated mammoth swine, you know, bringing back Mew in some capacity, I don't know, stuff like that. So, all right, so I think we really have, we didn't even make it through a quarter of the, or we made it through a lot of the replays I had saved, but not all of them. All right, so uh, thank you so much to Finch for joining. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this semi-podcast was enjoyable for you. And I will catch you guys next time. So, Finch, any final words? Peace, guys. Peace, uh, guys. Oh, yeah. Check out my channel. Yeah, Finch check out Finch. It. His link is in the description. It is well worth your time. All right. Thanks, guys.